Prologue of The Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. Prologue. Two young men met in front of the post office of a small country town. They were of the same age, 18. Each was well-dressed, comely, and apparently of good family, and each had an expression of face that would commend him to strangers, save that one of them, the larger of the two, had what is called a bad eye. That is, an eye showing just a little too much white above the iris. In the other's eye, white predominated below the iris. The former is usually the index of violent, though restrained, temper. The latter of an intuitive, psychic disposition with very little self-control. The difference in character so indicated may lead one person to the presidency, another to the gallows. And, though no such results are promised, with similar divergence of path, of pain and pleasure, of punishment and reward, is this story concerned. The two boys were schoolmates and friends, with never a quarrel since they had known each other. They had graduated together from the high school, but neither had been valedictorian. They later sought the competitive examination given by the congressman of the district for an appointment to the Naval Academy, and had won out overall, but so close together that the congressman had decreed another test. They had taken it, and since then had waited for the letter that named the winner. Hence, the daily visits to the post office, ending in this one, when the larger boy, about to go up the steps, met the smaller coming down with an open letter and smiling. I've got it, Jack, said the smaller boy joyously. Here it is. I win. But, of course, you're the alternate. Read it. He handed the letter to Jack, but it was declined. What's the use, was the somewhat sulky response. I've lost, sure enough. All I've got to do is to forget it. Then let me read it to you, said the winner eagerly. I want you to feel glad about it, same as I would if you had passed first. Listen. Mr. William Denman. Dear sir, I am glad to inform you that you have successfully passed the second examination for an appointment to the Naval Academy, winning by three points in history over the other contestant, Mr. John Forsyth, who, of course, is the alternate, in case you do not pass the entrance examination at Annapolis. Be ready at any time for instructions from the Secretary of the Navy to report at Annapolis. Sincerely yours, Jacob Bland. What do I care for that? said Forsyth. I suppose I've got a letter in there, too. Let's see. While Denman waited, Forsyth entered the post office, and soon emerged reading a letter. Same thing, he said. I failed by three points in my special study. How is it, Bill? he demanded fiercely, as his disappointment grew upon him. I've beaten not only you, but the whole class from the primary up in history, ancient, modern, and local, until now. There's something crooked here. His voice sank to a mutter. Crooked, Jack? What are you talking about? replied Denman hotly. Oh, I don't know, Bill. Never mind. Come on if you're going home. They walked side by side in the direction of their homes, near together and on the outskirts of the town each busy with his thoughts. 
Denman, though proud and joyous over the prize he had won, was yet hurt by the speech and manner of Forsyth, and hurt still further by the darkening cloud in his face as they walked on. Forsyth's thoughts were best indicated by his suddenly turning toward Denman and blurting out, Yes, I say, there's something crooked in this. I could beat you in history any day in the week, but your dad and old Bland are close friends. I see it now. Denman turned white as he answered. Do you want me to report your opinion to my father and Mr. Bland? Oh, you would, wouldn't you? And take from me the alternate, too. Well, you're a cur, Bill Denman. Go ahead and report. They were now on a block bounded by vacant lots, and no one was within sight. Denman stopped, threw off his coat, and said, No, I'll not report your opinion. But you square yourself, Jack Forsyth, and I'll show you the kind of cur I am. Forsyth turned, saw the anger in Denman's eyes, and promptly shed his coat. It was a short fight of one round only. Each fought courageously and with such fistic skills as schoolboys acquire, and each was equal to the other in strength. But one possessed about an inch longer reach than the other, which decided the battle. Denman, with nose bleeding and both eyes closing, went down at last and could not arise not even see the necessity of rising. But soon his brain cleared, and he staggered to his feet, his head throbbing viciously, and his face and clothing smeared with blood from his nose, to see between puffed eyelids the erect figure of Forsyth swaggering around a distant corner. He staunched the blow with his handkerchief, but as there was not a brook, a ditch, or a puddle in the neighborhood, he could only go home as he was, trusting that he would meet no one. Licked, he muttered. For the first time in my life, too. What do the old gentleman and mother say? What the father and mother might say, or what they did say, has no part in this story. But what another person said may have a place in value and will be given here. This person was the only one he met before reaching home. A very small person, about 13 years old, with big gray eyes and long dark ringlets who ran across the street to look at him. Why, Billy Denman, she cried, shocked and anxious. What has happened to you? Run over? No, Flory, he answered painfully. I've been licked. I had a fight. But don't you know it's wrong to fight, Billy? Maybe, answered Denman, trying to get more blood from his face to the already saturated handkerchief. But we all do wrong, sometimes. The child planted herself directly before him and looked chidingly into his discolored and disfigured face. Billy Denman, she said, shaking a small finger at him. Of course I'm sorry, but if you've been fighting when you know it is wrong, why, why it served you right? Had he not been aching in every joint, his nose, his lips, and his eyes, this unjust speech might have amused him. As it was, he answered testily. Florence Fleming, you're only a kid yet, though the best one I know. And if I should tell you the name I was called, and which brought on the fight, you would not understand. But you'll grow up some day, and then you will understand. Now, remember this fight. And when some woman, or possibly some man, calls you a, a cat, you'll feel like fighting too. But I wouldn't mind, she answered, firm in her position. 
Papa called me a kitten today, and I didn't get mad. Well, Flory, he said wearily, I won't try to explain. I'm going away before long, and perhaps I won't come back again. But if I do, there'll be another fight. Going away, Billy? She cried in alarm. Where to? To Annapolis. I may stay, or I may come back. I don't know. And you are going away, and you don't know that you'll come back. Oh, Billy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you got licked, too. Who did it? I hate him. Who licked you, Billy? Never mind, Flory. He'll tell the news, and you'll soon know who he is. He walked on, but the child headed to him and faced him. There were tears in the gray eyes. And you're going away, Billy, she exclaimed again. When are you going? I don't know, he answered. Whenever I'm sent for. If I don't see you again, goodbye, Flory girl. He stooped to kiss her, but straightened up, remembering the condition of his face. But I will see you again, she declared. I will. I will. I'll come to your house. And Billy, I'm sorry I scolded you. Really, I am. He smiled ruefully. Never mind that, Flory. You always scolded me, you know, and I'm used to it. But only when you did wrong, Billy, she answered gravely. And somehow I feel that this time you have not done wrong. But I won't scold you the next time you really do wrong, I promise. Oh, yes, you will, little girl. It's the privilege and prerogative of your sex. He patted her on the head and went on leaving her staring, open-eyed, and tearful. She was the child of a neighbor. He had mended her dolls, soothed her griefs, and protected her since infancy. But she was only as a small sister to him. While waiting for orders to Annapolis, he saw her many times, but she did not change to him. She changed, however. She had learned the name of his assailant, and through her expressed hatred for him, and through her sympathy for Billy as the disfigurements left his face, she passed the border between childhood and womanhood. When orders came, he stopped at her home, kissed her goodbye, and went to Annapolis, leaving her sad-eyed with quivering lips. And he did not come back. End of prologue. Chapter 1 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 1 She was the largest, fastest, and latest thing in seagoing destroyers. And though the specifications called for a 36 knots speed, she had made 38 on her trial trip. And later, under careful nursing by her engineers, she had increased this to 40 knots an hour. Five knots faster than any craft afloat. And, with a clean bottom, this speed could be depended upon at any time it was needed. She derived the speed from six water tube boilers feeding at a pressure of 300 pounds live steam to five turbine engines working three screws, one high-pressure turbine on the center shaft, and four low-pressure on the wing shafts. Besides these, she possessed two astern turbines and two cruising turbines, all four on the wing shafts. She made steam with oil fuel, there being no coal on board except for heating and cooking, and could carry 130 tons of it, which gave her a cruising radius of about 2,000 miles. 
Also, with peace tanks filled, she could steam 3,000 miles without replenishing. This would carry her across the Atlantic at 13 knots speed. But if she was in a hurry, using all turbines, she would exhaust her oil in two days. When in a hurry, she was a spectacle to remember. Built on conventional lines, she showed at a mile's distance nothing but a high bow and four short funnels over a mighty bow wave that hid the rest of her long, dark-hued hull and a black, horizontal cloud of smoke that stretched astern half a mile before the wind could catch and rend it. She carried four 21-inch torpedo tubes and a battery of six 12-pounder rapid-fire guns. Also, she carried two large searchlights and a wireless equipment of 70 miles reach, the aerials of which stretched from the truck of her short signal mast aft to the short pole at the taffrail. Packed with machinery, she was a hot box, even when at rest, and when in action, a veritable bake oven. She had hygienic airspace below decks for about a dozen men, and this number could handle her, but she carried berths and accommodations for 60. Her crew was not on board, however. Newly scraped and painted in the dry dock, she had been hauled out, stored, and fueled by a Navy Yard gang, and now lay at the dock ready for sea, ready for her draft of men in the morning and with no one on board for the night but the executive officer, who, with something on his mind, had elected to remain, while the captain and other commission officers went ashore for the night. Four years of the Naval Academy, a two-year sea cruise, and a year of actual service had made many changes in Denman. He was now 25, an ensign, but, because of his position as executive, bearing the complimentary title of lieutenant. He was a little taller and much straighter and squarer of shoulder than he was when he had gone to the academy. He had grown a trim mustache, and the sun and winds of many seas had tanned his face to the color of his eyes, which were of a clear brown, and only in repose did they now show the old-time preponderance of white beneath the brown. In action, these eyes looked out through two slits formed by nearly parallel eyelids, and with the tightly closed lips and the high arching eyebrows, sure sign of the highest and best form of physical and moral courage, they gave his face a sort of take-care look, which most men heeded. Some women would have thought him handsome. Some would not. It all depended upon the impression they made of him and the consequent look in his eyes. At Annapolis, he had done well. He was the most popular man of his class, had won honors from his studies and fistfights from his fellows. While at sea, he had shown a reckless disregard for his life in such matters as bursting flues, men overboard, and other casualties of seafaring that brought him many typewritten letters from Washington a few numbers of advancement, and the respect and admiration of all that knew or had heard of him. His courage, like Mrs. Caesar's morals, was above suspicion. Yet there was one man in the world who was firmly convinced that Lieutenant Denman had a yellow streak in him, and that man was Denman himself. He had never been home since his departure for Annapolis. He had promised a small girl that if he came back, there would be another fight, in which, as he mentally vowed, he would redeem himself. In this he had been sincere, but as the months of the academy went on, with the unsettled fight still in the future, his keen resentment died away, leaving in his place a sense of humiliation and chagrin. He still meant to go back, however, and would have done so when vacation came, but a classmate invited him to his home, and there he went, glad of the reprieve from embarrassing, and, as it seemed to him now, 
an undignified conflict with a civilian. But the surrender brought its sting, and his self-respect lessened. At the next vacation, he surrendered again, and the sting began eating into his soul. He thought of the overdue redemption he had promised himself at all times and upon all occasions. But oftenest just before going to sleep, with the mental picture of Jack Forsyth swaggering around the corner, while he lay conquered and helpless on the ground, would accompany him through his dreams and be with him when he wakened in the morning. It became an obsession, and very soon the sudden thought of his coming fight with Forsyth brought the uplift of the heart and the slight choking sensation that betokened nothing but fear. He would not admit it at first, but finally was compelled to. Honest with himself as he was with others, he finally yielded in the mental struggle and accepted the dictum of his mind. He was afraid to fight Jack Forsyth, with no reference to or regard for his standing as an officer and a gentleman. But now, it seemed, all this was to leave him. A month before, he had thought strongly of his child friend, Flory. And, with nothing to do one afternoon, he had written her a letter. A jolly, rollicking letter, filled with masculine colloquialisms and friendly endearments, such as he had bestowed upon her at home. And it was the dignity of her reply, received that day, with the contents of the letter which was the something on his mind that kept him aboard. His cheeks burned as he realized that she was now about twenty years old, a young lady, and that his letter to her had been sadly conceived and much out of place. But the news in the letter, which began with, Dear Sir, and ended with, Sincerely Yours, affected him most. It read, I presume that you know your enemy, Jack Forsyth, took his disappointment so keenly that he never amounted to much at home, but about two years ago enlisted in the Navy. This relieves you, as father tells me, from the necessity of thrashing him, as you declared you would. Officers and enlisted men cannot fight, he said as the officer has the advantage, and can always order the man to jail. I thank you very much for remembering me after all these years. In fact, I shall never forget your kindness. His cheeks and ears had burned all day, and when his fellow officers had gone and he was alone, he reread the letter. Sarcasm and contempt between every line, he muttered. She expected me, the whole town expected me, to come back and lick that fellow. Well, his eyelids became rigidly parallel. I'll do it. When I find him, I'll get shore leave for both of us. Take him home and square the account. This resolution did him good. The heat left his cheek, and the sudden jump of the heart did not come with the occasional thought of the task. Gradually, the project took form. He would learn what ship Forsyth was in, get transferred to her, and when in port, arrange the shore leave. He could not fight him in the Navy, but as man to man, in civilian's clothing in the town park. He would fight him and thrash him before the populace. It was late when he had finished the planning. He lighted the last cigar and sauntered around the deck until the cigar was consumed. Then he went to his room and turned in, thinking of the caustic words of Miss Flory, forgiving her the while and wondering how she looked, grown up. They were pleasant thoughts to go to sleep on. But sleep did not come. It was an intensely hot, muggy night, and the mosquitoes were thick. He tried another room, 
then another, and at last, driven out of the wardroom by the pests, he took refuge in the steward's pantry, and spreading his blanket on the floor, went to sleep on it. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of The Pirates by Morton Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe Denoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter Two He slept soundly, and as he slept, the wind blew up from the east, driving the mosquitoes to cover and bringing with it a damp, impenetrable fog that sank down over the navy yard and hid sentry from sentry, compelling them to count their steps as they paced. They were scattered throughout the yard at various important points, one at the gangway of each ship of the docks, others at corners and entrances to the different walks that traversed the green lawn, and others under the walls of the huge naval prison. One of these, whose walk extended from corner to corner, heard something, and paused often to listen intently, his eyes peering around into the fog. But the sound was not repeated while he listened. Only as his footfalls sounded soggily on a damp path were they punctuated by this still, small sound that he could not localize or remember. If asked, he might have likened it to the rustling of paper or the sound of a cat's claws digging into a carpet. But at last it ceased, and he went back and forth many times without hearing it. Then, when about halfway from corner to corner, a heavy body came down from above, landing on his head and shoulders, and bearing him to earth, while his rifle was knocked from his hand, and big fingers clutched his throat. He struggled, and endeavored to call out, but the grip on his throat was too strong, and finally he quieted, his last flicker of consciousness cognizing other dropping bodies and the muttered and whispered words of men. So much for this sentry. I know the way, whispered the garroter, and a few gathered around him. We'll make a beeline for the dock and avoid him. Then, if we can't find a boat, We'll swim for it. It's the only way. Right, whispered another. Fall in here, behind Jenkins, all of you. The whispered word was passed along, and in single file the dark brown bodies, each marked on knee and elbow with a white number, followed the leader, Jenkins. He led them across the green, around corners where sentries were not, and down to the dock where lay the destroyer. Here was a sentry pacing up and down, but so still was their approach that he did not see them until they were right upon him. Who goes? He started, but the challenge was caught in his throat. He, too, was choked until consciousness almost left him. Then the stricture was relaxed while they questioned him. Got a boat around here? hissed Jenkins in his ear. Whisper. Don't speak. No, gasped the sentry, unable to speak louder had he dared. How many men are aboard the destroyer? was asked. None now. Crew joins in the morning. Nobody on board, you say? Lie quiet. If you raise a row, I'll drop you overboard. Come here, you fellows. They closed about him, thirteen in all, and listened to his project. He was a pilot of the bay. How many machinists were there in the party? Four claimed the rating. Right enough, said Jenkins. We'll run her out. She's oil fuels, I understand. You can fire up in ten minutes, can't you? Good. Come on. 
wait, though. Jenkins, with his grip of steel, was equal to the task of tearing a strip from his brown prison jacket, and with this he securely gagged the poor sentry. Another strip from another jacket bound his hands behind him, and still another secured him to a mooring cleat face upward. This done, they silently filed aboard and spread through the interior. The sentry had spoken truly, they agreed, when they mustered together. There was no one on board, and the machinists reported plenty of oil fuel. Soon the fires were lighted and the indicator began to move, as the boilers made steam. They did not wait for full pressure. Jenkins had spread out a chart in the pilot house, and when the engines could turn over, he gave the word. Lines were taken in except a spring to back on. Then this was cast off, and the long, slim hull moved almost silently away from the deck. Jenkins steered by the light of a match held over the compass until there was steam enough to turn the dynamos. Then the electrics were turned on in the pilot house, engine room, and side light boxes, by which time the dock was out of sight in the fog, and they dared speak in articulate words. Their language was profane but joyous, and their congratulations hearty and sincere. A table knife is an innocent and innocuous weapon, but two table knives are not, for one can be used against the other so skillfully as to form a fairly good hacksaw, with which prison bars may be sawed. The sawing of steel bars was a sound that the sentry had heard mingling with his footfalls. Jenkins, at the wheel, called to the crowd. Take the wheel, one of you, he ordered. I've just rounded the corner. Keep her southeast, half south for a mile. I'll be here then. I want to rig the log over the stern. The man answered, and Jenkins departed with the boat's patent log. Down in the engine and boiler rooms were the four machinists. Engineers, they would be called in merchant steamers. And under their efforts, the engines turned faster, while the growing bow wave spread from each side of the sharp stern. The fog was still thick. So thick that the fan-shaped beams from the side lights could not pierce it as far as the bow. And the forward funnel was barely visible. A magnified black stump. Jenkins was back among them soon, remarking that she made twenty knots already. Then he slowed down, ordered the lead hove, each side, and ringing full speed, quietly took the wheel. Changing the course again to east, quarter north, and ordering a man aloft to keep a lookout in the thinner fog for lights ahead. In a few minutes, the man reported, a fixed white light four points off the starboard bow. And a little later, a fixed white and red flashlight two points off the port bow. Good, grunted Jenkins. I know just where I am. Come down from aloft, he called, and watch out for buoys. I'm going out the south in Hippocrate channels. Then a dull boom rang out from astern followed by another, and another, and Jenkins laughed. They found that sentry, he said, and have telephoned Fort Independence. But it's no good. They've only got salute guns. We passed that fort twenty minutes ago. Any others? they asked. Fort Warren down on the Narrows. That's why I'm going through the Hippocrates. Keep your eyes peeled for buoys, you ginks, and keep those leads going. Calm and imperturbable, a huge, square-faced giant of a man, Jenkins naturally assumed the leadership of this band of jailbreakers. The light from the binnacle illuminated the countenance of rugged yet symmetrical features, stamped with prison pallor. 
but also stamped with a stronger imprint of refinement. A man palpably out of place, no doubt. A square peg in a round hole. A man with every natural attribute of a master of men. Some act of rage or passion, perhaps. Some non-adjustment to an unjust environment had sent him to the naval prison to escape and become a pirate. For that was the legal status of all. Soon the wind shifted and the fog cleared to seaward, but still held its impenetrable wall between them and the town. Then it turned on both searchlights and saw buoys ahead to starboard and port. Jenkins boasted a little. I've run these channels for years, he said, and I know them as I know the old backyard at home. Hello, what's up? A man had run to the pilot house door in great excitement. An officer aboard, he whispered. I was down looking for grub and saw him. He's been asleep. Take the wheel, said Jenkins calmly. Keep her as she goes and leave that black buoy to starboard. Then he stepped out on deck. End of chapter two. Chapter three of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya. Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 3 Seamen, officers as well as men, accustomed to watch and watch of four hours alternate duty and sleep, usually waken at eight bells, even when sure of an all-night sleep. It was long after midnight when Denman had gone to sleep on the pantry floor, and the slight noise of getting underway did not arouse him. But when eight bells came round again, he sat up, confused, not conscious that he had been called, but dimly realizing that the boat was at sea, and that he was culpable in not being on deck. The crew had come, no doubt, and he had overslept. He did not immediately realize that it was still dark, and that if the crew had come, the steward would have found him. He dressed hurriedly in his room and went on deck, spying a fleeing man in brown mounting the steps ahead of him and looking round. Astern was a fog bank, and ahead the open sea, toward which the boat was charging at full speed. As he looked, a man came aft and faced him. Denman expected that he would step aside while he passed, but he did not. Instead, he blocked his way. Are you an officer of this boat, sir? Asked the man respectfully. I am. What do you want? Only to tell you, sir, that she is not now under the control of the Navy Department. My name is Jenkins and with twelve others I escaped from the prison tonight and took charge of this boat for a while. We did not know you were on board. Denman started back and felt for his pocket pistol, but it was in his room. However, Jenkins had noticed the movement and immediately sprang upon him, bearing him against the nearest ventilator and pinioning his arms to his side. None of that, sir said the giant sternly. Were there any others on board beside yourself? Not that I know of, answered Denman with forced calmness. The crew had not joined when I went to sleep. What do you intend to do with me? He had seen man after man approach from forward, and now a listening group surrounded him. That's for you to decide, sir. If you will renounce your official position, we'll put you on parole. If you will not, you will be confined below decks till we're ready to leave this craft. All we want is our liberty. 
How do you intend to get it? Every warship in the world will chase this boat. There is not a craft in the world that can catch her, rejoined Jenkins. But that is beside the point. Will you go on parole, sir, or in irons? How many are there in your party? Thirteen, all told. And that, too, is beside the point. Answer quickly, sir. I am needed at the wheel. I accept your offer, said Denman, because I want fresh air, and nothing will be gained in honor and integrity in my resisting you. However, I shall not assist you in any way. Even if I see you going to destruction, I shall not warn you. That is enough, sir, answered Jenkins. You give me your word of honor, do you, as an American naval officer, not to interfere with the workings of this boat or the movements of her crew until after we have left her? I give you my word, said the young officer, not without some misgivings. You seem to be in command. What shall I call you? Herbert Jenkins, Seaman Gunner. Captain Jenkins, growled a man, and others repeated it. Captain Jenkins, responded Denman, I greet you cordially. My name is William Denman, ensign in the United States Navy, and formerly executive officer of this boat. A suppressed exclamation came from the group. A man stepped forward, peered closely into Denman's face, then stepped back. None of that, Forsyth, said Jenkins sternly. We're all to treat Mr. Denman with respect. Now, you fellows, step forward and introduce yourselves. I know only a few of you by name. Jenkins went to the wheel, picked up the buoys played upon by the searchlights, and sent the man to join the others, as one after another faced Denman and gave his name. Guess you know me, Mr. Denman, said Forsyth, the first to respond. I know you, Forsyth, answered Denman, hot and ashamed, for at the sight and sound of him, the old heart jump and throat ache had returned. He fought it down, however, and listened to the names as the men gave them. William Hawks, seaman. George Davis, seaman. John Kelly, gunner's mate. Percy Daniels, ship's cook. And Thomas Billings, wardroom steward. John Casey and Frank Munson, they explain, were at the searchlights forward, and down below were the four machinists, Riley, Sampson, King, and Dwyer. Denman politely bowed his acknowledgments and asked the ratings of the searchlight men. Wireless operators, they answered. You seem well-equipped and well-chosen men, he said, to run this boat and to lead the government a lively dance for a while. But until the end comes, I hope we will get on without friction. In the absence of the masterful Jenkins, they made embarrassed replies. All but Forsyth, who remains silent. For no sudden upheaval and reversing relations will eliminate the enlisted man's respect for an officer. Daylight had come, and Jenkins, having cleared the last of the buoys, called down the man at the searchlights. You're wireless sharps, aren't you? he asked. Go down to the apparatus and see if you can pick up any messages. The whole coast must be aroused. The two obeyed him and went in search of the wireless room. Soon, one returned. The air is full of talk, he said. Casey's at the receiver, still listening, but I made out only a few words like Charleston, Brooklyn, jail, pirates, Pensacola, and one phrasing, send in pursuit. 
The open sea for us, said Jenkins grimly, until we could think out a plan. Send one of those soldiers to the wheel. A soldier, one who, so far, had done no work, relieved him, and he mustered his men, all but two in the engine room, to a council of midships. Briefly, he stated the situation, as hinted at by Denman, and verified by the wireless messages. Every nation in the world would send its cruisers after them, and no civilized country would receive them. There was but one thing to do under the circumstances. Make for the wild coast of Africa, destroy the boat, and land, each man to work out his future as he could. After a little parley, they assented, taking no thought of fuel or food, and trusting the Jenkins' power to navigate. Then, it being broad daylight, they raided the boat's stores for clothing and discarded their prison suits of brown for the blue of the navy. Jenkins, the logical commander, donning the uniform of the captain, as large a man as himself. Next, they chose their bunks in the forecastle, and, as they left the deck, Jenkins picked up a bright object from the floor and absently put it in his trouser pocket. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 4 The boat was now charging due east at full speed, out in the broad Atlantic. And, as the full light of day spread over the sea, a few specks and trails of smoke astern showed themselves. But whether or not they were pursuing craft that had crept close in the darkness while they were making steam could not be determined, for they soon sank beneath the horizon. Assured of immediate safety, Jenkins now stationed his crew. Forsyth was a seaman. He and Hawks, Davis, and Kelly, the gunner's mate, would comprise the deck force. Riley, Sampson, King, and Dwyer, all machinists, would attend to the engine and boilers. Casey and Munson, the two wireless operators, would attend to their department. Walt Daniels and Billings, the cook and steward, would cook and serve the meals. There would be no officers, Jenkins declared. All were to stand watch and work faithfully and amicably for the common good. And all disputes were to be referred to him. To this they agreed, for, though many they were of higher comparative rating in the Navy, Jenkins had a strong voice, a dominating personality, and a heavy fist. But Jenkins had his limitations as came out during the confab. He could not navigate. He had been an expert pilot of Boston Bay before joining the Navy, but in the open sea, he was as helpless as any. However, he said in extenuation, we only need to sail about southeast to reach the African coast. When we hit it, we'll know it. So the course was changed, and soon they sat down to their breakfasts, such a meal as they had not tasted in years. Wardroom grub, every mouthful. Denman was invited, and, as he was a prisoner on parole, he was not too dignified to accept, though he took no part in the hilarious conversation. But neither did Forsyth. Denman went to his room, locked up his private papers, and surrendered his revolver to Jenkins, who declined it. He then put it with his papers and returned to the deck, seating himself in a deck chair on the quarter. The watch had gone down, and those on deck, under Jenkins, who stood no watch, busied themselves in necessary cleaning up of decks, 
and stowing below of the fenders the boat had worn at the dock. Forsyth had gone below, and Denman was somewhat glad in his heart to be free of him until he had settled his mind in regard to his attitude towards him. Manifestly, he, a prisoner on parole, could not seek a conflict with him. On the contrary, should Forsyth seek it, by word or deed, he could not meet him without breaking his parole, which would bring him close confinement. Then, too, that prospective fight and vindication before Miss Flory and his townsmen seemed of very small importance compared with the exigency at hand, the stealing by jailbreakers of the Navy's best destroyer and one of its officers. His duty was to circumvent these fellows and return the boat to the government. To accomplish this, he must be tactful and diplomatic, deferring action till the time should come when he could safely ask to be released from parole. And with regard to this, he was glad that Forsyth, though as evil-eyed as before, and with an additional truckling expression of the face, had thus far shown him no incivility. He was glad, too, because in his heart there was no revengeful thoughts about Forsyth, nothing but thoughts of duty to himself that had been sadly neglected. Thus tranquilized, he lit a cigar and looked around the horizon. A speck in the north caught his eye, and as he watched, it became a spot, then a tangible silhouette. A battleship, though of what country, he could not determine. It was heading on a course that would intercept their own, and in a short time, at the speed they were making, the destroyer would be within range of her heavy guns, one shell from which could break the frail craft in two. Jenkins and his crowd were busy. The man at the wheel was steering by compass and looking ahead, and it was the wireless operator on watch, Casey, who rushed on deck, looked at the battleship, and shouted to Jenkins. Don't you see that fellow? he yelled excitedly. I heard him before I saw him. He asked, what ship is that? Jenkins looked to the north, just in time to see a tongue of red dark from the casemate port. Then, as the bark of the gun came down the wind, a spurt of water lifted from the sea about a hundred yards ahead. Port your wheel hard over, yelled Jenkins, running forward. The destroyer swung to the southward, showing her stern to the battleship, and increasing her speed as the engine room staff nursed the oil feed and the turbines. Black smoke, unconsumed carbon that even the blowers could not ignite, belched up from the four short funnels, and partly hid her from the battleship's view. But, obscure though she was, she could not quite hide herself in her smoke, nor could her speed carry her faster than the twelve-inch shells that now came plowing through the air. They fell close, to starboard and to port, and a few came perilously near to the stern. But none hit or exploded, and soon they were out of range, and the firing ceased, the battleship heading to the west. Jenkins came aft and looked sternly at Denman, still smoking his cigar. Did you see that fellow before we did? He asked. I did, answered Denman, returning his stare. Why didn't you sing out? If we're sunk, you drown too, don't you? You forget, Captain Jenkins, that I accepted my parole on condition that I should neither interfere with you nor assist you. But your life, don't you value that? Not under some conditions. If I cannot emerge from this adventure with credit and honor intact, I prefer death. Do you understand? Jenkins' face worked visibly as anger left it and wondering doubt appeared. Then his countenance cleared and he smiled. You're right, sir. I understand now. But you know what we mean to do, don't you? Make the African coast and scatter. You can stand for that, can you? 
not unless I have to, but you will not reach the coast. You will be hunted down and caught before then. Jenkins' face clouded again. And what part will you play if that comes? he asked. No part, active or resistant, unless first released from parole. But if I ask for that release, it will be at a time when I'm in greater danger than now. I promise you that. Very well, sir. Ask for it when you like. And Jenkins went forward. The course to the southeast was resumed, but in half an hour, two other specks in the southern horizon resolved into scout cruisers heading their way, and they turned to the east, still rushing at full speed. They soon dropped the scouts, however, but were again driven to the north by a second battleship that shelled their vicinity for an hour before they got out of range. It was somewhat discouraging, but... As darkness closed down, they once more headed their course. And all night, they charged along at forty knots, with lights extinguished, but with every man's eyes searching the darkened horizon for other lights. They dodged a few, but daylight brought to view three cruisers ahead and to port that showed unmistakable hostility in the shape of screaming shells and solid shot. Again they charged to the north, and it was midday before the cruisers were dropped. They were French, as all knew by their build. Though there was no one navigating the boat, Denman, in view of future need of it, took upon himself the winding of the chronometers. And the days went on, Casey and Munson reporting messages sent from shore to ship. Battleships, cruisers, scouts, and destroyers appearing and disappearing, and their craft racing around the Atlantic like a hunted fox. Jenkins did his best to keep track of the various courses, but, not skilled at traverse, grew bewildered at last, and finally intimated that he did not know where they were. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 5 One morning there was a council of war amidships to which Denman was not invited until it adjourned as a council to become a committee of ways and means. Then they came aft in a body and asked him to navigate. No, said Denman, firmly, rising to his feet and facing them. I will not navigate unless you surrender this craft to me and work her back to Boston, where you will return to the prison. Well, we won't do that, shouted several angrily. Wait, you fellows, said Jenkins firmly and speak respectfully to an officer while he acts like one. Mr. Denman, your position need not be changed for the worse. You can command this boat and all hands if you will take us to the African coast. My position would be changed, answered Denman. If I command this boat, I take her back to Boston, not to the African coast. Very well, sir, said Jenkins a shade of disappointment on his face. We cannot force you to join us or to help us. So, well, come forward, you fellows. Say, Jenkins, broke in Forsyth. You're doing a lot of dictating here, and I've wondered why. Who gave you the right to decide? You admit your incompetency. You can't navigate, can you? No, I cannot, retorted Jenkins, flushing. Neither can I learn at my age. Neither can you. I can't, stormed Forsyth, his eyes glaring white as he glanced from Jenkins to Denman and back. Well, I'll tell you I can. I tell you I haven't forgotten all I learned at school 
and I could pick up navigation without currying favor from this milk-fed thief. You know well, he advanced and held his fist under Demon's face, that I won the appointment you robbed me of, and that the uniform you wear belongs to me. At the first word, Demon's heart gave the old familiar thump and jump into his throat. Then came a quick reaction, a tingling at the hair roots, an opening of the eyes, followed by their closing to narrow slits. And, with the full weight of his body behind, he crashed his fist into Forsythe's face, sending him reeling and whirling to the deck. He would have followed to repeat the punishment, but the other stopped him. In an intoxication of ecstasy at the unexpected adjustment of his mental poise, he struck out again and again and floored three or four of them before Jenkins backed him against the companion. He's broke his parole. Put him in irons. Chuck him overboard. They coursed and closed around him threateningly. Though Forsyth, his hand to his face, remained in the background. That's right, sir, said Jenkins, holding Demon at the end of one long arm. You have violated your agreement with us, and we must consider you a prisoner under confinement. All right, panted Demon. Iron me if you like. But first form a ring and let me thrash that dog. He thrashed me at school when I was the smaller and weaker. I've promised him a licking. Let me give it to him. No, sir, we will not, answered Jenkins. Things are too serious for fighting. You must hand me that pistol and any arms that you may have and be confined to the wardroom. And you, Forsyth, he said, looking at the victim. If you can master navigation, get busy and make good. And you other ginks, get out of here. Talk it over amongst yourselves. And if you agree with Forsyth that I'm not in command here, Get busy, too, and I'll overrule you. He released Denman, moved around among them, looking each man steadily in the face, and then staggered forward. Now, sir, he said to Denman, come below. Denman followed him down the companion and into the wardroom. Knowing the etiquette as well as Jenkins, he led him to his room, opened his desk and all receptacles, and Jenkins secured the revolver. Is this all you have, sir? asked Jenkins. Why do you ask that? answered Denman hotly. As a prisoner, why may I not lie to you? Because, Mr. Denman, I think you wouldn't. However, I won't ask. I'll search this room and the whole boat, confiscating every weapon. You will have the run of your stateroom and the wardroom, but will not be allowed on deck. And you will not be annoyed, except perhaps to lend Forsyth any books he may want. He's the only educated man in the crowd. Better send him down under escort, responded Denman, if you want him back. Yes, yes, that'll be attended to. I've no part in your private affair, sir, but you gave him a good one, and that ought to be enough for a while. If you tackle him again, you'll have a whole bunch at you. Better let well enough alone. Denman sat down in his room, and Jenkins departed. Soon he came back with three others, the steadiest men of the crew, and they made a systematic search for weapons in the wardroom and all the staterooms opening from it. Then they locked the doors leading to the captain's quarters and the doors leading forward, and went on deck, leaving Denman a prisoner, free to concoct any antagonistic plan that came to his mind. But he made none as yet. He was too well contented and happy, not so much of being released from a somewhat false position as a prisoner under parole, as in the lifting of the burden of the years. The shame, humiliation, chagrin, and anger dating from the school day thrashing. 
He smiled as he recalled the picture of Forsyth staggering along the deck. The smile became a grin, then a soft chuckle, ending in joyous laughter. Then he applied the masculine lever of all emotion. He smoked. The staterooms, robbed of all weapons, were left open, and as each room contained a deadlight or circular window, he had a view of the sea on each beam, but nothing ahead or astern. Nor could he hear voices on deck unless pitched in a high key, for the men, their training strong upon them, remained forward. There was nothing on either horizon at present. The boat was storming along to the southward, as he knew by a glance at the telltale overhead, and all seemed well with the runaways, until a sudden stopping of the engines roused him up to peer out the deadlight and speculate as to what was ahead. But he saw nothing from either side, and strained his ears for sounds from the deck. There was excitement above. Voices from forward came to him, muffled, but angry and argumentative. They grew louder as the men came aft, and soon he could distinguish Jenkins' loud profanity, drowning the protests of the others. She's a fire and her boats are burned. There's a woman aboard. I tell you, we're not going to let him drown. Over with that boat, or I'll stretch some of you out on deck. Oh, you will, Forsyth. Then came a thud, as of the swift contact of two hard objects, and a sound as of a bag of potatoes falling to the deck, which told Demon that someone had been knocked down. Go ahead with the machine, Samson, said Jenkins again, and forward there. Port your wheel, and steer for the yacht. Demon sprang to a starboard deadlight and looked. He could now see slantwise through the thick glass, a large steam yacht, a fire from her mainmast to her bow, and on the still intact quarter deck, a woman frantically beckoning. Men nearer the fire seemed to be fighting it. The picture disappeared from view as the boat, under the impulse of her engines and wheel, straightened to a course for the wreck. Soon the engine stopped again, and Denman heard the sounds of the boat being lowered. He saw this boat leave the side, manned by Hawks, Davis, Forsyth, and Kelly, but it soon left his field of vision, and he waited. Then came a dull, coughing, prolonged report, and the voices on deck broke out. Blown up, yelled Jenkins. She's sinking forward. She's cut in two. Where are they? Where's the woman? That wasn't powder, Riley. What was it? Steam, answered the machinist coolly. They didn't rake the fires until too late, I suppose, and left the engine under one bell, possibly, while they steered for the wind with the preventer tiller. They've got somebody. Can't you see? It's the woman, blown overboard. See anyone else? I don't. Riley did not answer, and soon Jenkins spoke again. They're coming back. Only the woman. Only the woman out of the whole crowd. They better hurry up, responded Riley. What's that over the Nord? Nothing but a tramp, said Jenkins at length. But we don't want to be interviewed. Bear a hand, you fellows, he shouted. Is the woman dead? No, guess not, came the answer through the small deadlight. Fainted away since we picked her up. Burned or scalded somewhat. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 6 Denman saw the boat for a moment or two as it came alongside, and noticed the still form of the woman in the stern sheets, her face hidden by a black silk neckerchief. Then he could only know by the voices that they were lifting her aboard and aft to the captain's quarters. But he was somewhat surprised to see the door that led to these quarters opened by Jenkins, who beckoned him. We've picked up a poor woman, sir, he said, and put her in here. Now, we're too busy on deck to tend to her, Mr. Denman, and then, we don't know how. But, well, you're an educated man, and a gentleman. Would you mind? I've chased the bunch out, and I won't let them bother you. It's just an extension of your cruising radius. Certainly, said Denman. I'll do what I can for her. All right, sir. I'll leave this door open, but I must lock the after companion. He went on deck by the wardroom stairs, while Denman passed through to the woman. She lay on a transom, dripping water from her clothing to the carpet, and with the black cloth still over her face. But, on hearing his footsteps, she removed it, showing a countenance puffed and crimson from the scalding of the live steam that had blown her overboard. Then, groaning pitifully, she sat up and looked at him through swollen eyelids. What is it? she exclaimed weakly. What has happened? Where is father? Madam, said Denman gently. You have been picked up from a steam yacht which exploded her boilers. Are you in pain? What can I do for you? I don't know. Yes, I am in pain. My face. Wait, I'll get you what I can from the medicine chest. Devin explored the surgeon's quarters and returned with bandages and a mixture of linseed oil and lime water. He gently laughed and bound the poor woman's face and then led her to the captain's berth. Go in, he said. Take off your wet clothes and put on these pajamas. Here they are. He produced them from a locker. And then turn in. I will be here and will take care of you. He departed, and when he saw the wet garments flung out, he gathered them and hung them up to dry. It was all he could do, except to look through the surgeon's quarters for stimulants, which he found. He poured out a strong dose of brandy, which he gave to the woman and had the satisfaction of seeing her sink into profound slumber. Then, returning to the wardroom, he found Jenkins waiting for him. I'm after a sextant, Mr. Denman, he said. An almanac. A nautical almanac. Forsyth wants them. You must find them yourself, then, answered Denman. Neither under parole nor confinement will I aid you in any way unless you surrender. Nonsense, said Jenkins impatiently, as he stepped past Denman and approached a bookcase. When we're through with the boat, you can have her. He had incautiously turned his back. Denman saw the protruding butt of his pistol in Jenkins' pocket, and, without any formulated plan for the future, only seeing a momentary advantage in the possession of the weapon, pounced on his shoulders, and endeavored to secure it. But he was not able to. He could only hold on, his arms around Jenkins' neck, while the big sailor hove his huge body from side to side, and, gripping his legs, endeavored to shake him off. No word was spoken. Only their deep breathing attested to their earnestness and they thrashed around the wardroom like a dog and a cat. Denman, 
In the latter similitude, in the air most of the time. But he was getting the worst of it. And at last to say the trick he knew of, taught him in Japan, and to be used as a last resort. Gripping his legs tightly around the body of Jenkins, he sagged down and pressed the tips of his forefingers into two vulnerable parts of the thick neck, where certain important nerves approach the surface, parts as vulnerable as the heel of Achilles. Still clinging, he mercilessly continued the pressure, while Jenkins swayed back and forth and finally fell backward to the floor. Deadman immediately secured the pistol. Then, panting hard, he examined his victim. Jenkins was breathing with the greatest difficulty, but could not speak or move, and his big eyes glared piteously up at his conqueror. The latter would have ironed him at once, but the irons were forward in the arm room. So he temporarily bound him hand and foot with neckties replevin from his fellow officers' staterooms. Then, relieving Jenkins of his keys, he went forward through the front door to the arm room, from which he removed not only wrist and leg arms, but every cutlass and service revolver that the boat was stocked with, and a plentiful supply of ammunition. First, properly securing the still inert and helpless Jenkins, he dragged him to a corner, and then stowed the paraphernalia of war in his room, loading as many as a dozen of the heavy revolvers. He was still without a plan, working under intense excitement and could only follow impulses, the next of which was to lock the wardroom companion down, which Jenkins had come, and to see that the forward door and the after companion were secured. This done, he sat down abreast of his prisoner to watch him and think it out. There was no change in Jenkins. He still breathed hard and endeavored unsuccessfully to speak, while his eyes, the angry glare gone from them, looked up inquiringly. Oh, you're all right, Captain Jenkins, said Denman. You'll breathe easier tomorrow. And in a week, perhaps, you may speak a whisper. But you are practically deprived from command. So make the best of it. Jenkins seemed willing to, but this did not solve the problem. There were twelve other recalcitrants on deck who might not be so easily jiu into weakness and dumbness. As the situation cleared, he saw two ways of solving it. One, to remain below, and from the shelter of his room, to pop them one by one as they came down. The other, to take the initiative, assert himself on deck behind the menace of cocked revolvers, and overawe them into submission. The first plan involved hunger, for he could eat nothing not provided by them. The other, a quick and certain ending of the false position he was in a plan very appealing to his temperament. He rose to his feet with a final inspection of Jenkins' bonds, and, going to his room, belted and armed himself with three heavy revolvers, then opened the wardroom companion door and stepped to the deck. No one was in sight except a man at the wheel, not now steering in the close, armored conning tower but at the upper wheel on the bridge. He looked aft, and, spying Denman, gave a shout of warning. But no one responded, and Denman, with a clear field, advanced forward, looking to the right and left, until he reached the engine room hatch, down which he peered. Riley's anxious face looked up at him, and farther down was the cringing form of King, his mate of the starboard watch. Dem did not know their names, but he sternly commanded them to come up. We can't leave the engine, sir, said Riley, 
shrinking under the cold argument of two cold blue tubes pointed at them. Shut off your gas, and never mind your engines, commanded Denman. Come up on deck quietly, or I'll put holes in you. King shut off the gas. Riley turned a valve that eased off the making steam, and the two appeared before Denman. Lie down on deck, the two of you, said Denman sharply. Take off your neckerchiefs and give them to me. They obeyed him. He took the two squares of black silk, similar to that which had covered the face of the rescued woman, and with them he bound their hands tightly behind their backs. Lie still now, he said, until I settle matters. They could rise and move, but could not thwart him immediately. He went forward and mounted to the bridge. How are you heading, he demanded, with a pistol pointed toward the helmsman. South. Due south, sir, answered the man. It was Davis of the starboard watch. Leave the wheel. The engine has stopped. Down on deck with you and take off your neckerchief. Davis descended meekly, gave him the neckerchief, and was bound as were the others. Then Denman looked for the rest. So far, good. He had three prisoners on deck and one in the wardroom. The rest were below, on duty or asleep. They were in the forecastle, the crew's quarters, in the wireless room below the bridge, in the galley just forward of the wardroom. Denman had his choice, and decided on the forecastle as the place containing the greatest number. Down the forehatch he went and entered the apartment. A man rolled out of a bunk and faced him. Up with your hands said Denman softly. Up, quickly. The man's hands went up. All right, sir, he answered, sleepily and somewhat weakly. My name's Hawks, and I haven't yet disobeyed an order from an officer. Don't, warned Denman sharply. Take off your neckerchief. Off came the black silk square. Wake up the man nearest you. Tie his hands behind his back and take off his necktie. It was a machinist named Samson who was wakened and bound, with the cold, blue tube of Demon's pistol looking at him. And then it was Dwyer, his watchmate, and Munson, the wireless man off duty, ending with old Kelly the gunner's mate, each tied with a neckerchief of the last man waken, and Hawks, the first to surrender, with the neckerchief of Kelly. On deck with you all, commanded Demon, and he drove them up the steps to the deck, where they lay down beside Riley, King, and Davis. None spoke or protested, each felt the inhibition of the presence of a commissioned officer, and Demon might have won, might have secured the rest and brought them under control, had not a bullet sped from the after companion, which, besides knocking his cap from his head, inflicted a glancing wound on his scalp and sent him headlong to the deck. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 7 After the rescue of the woman, all but those on duty had mustered forward near the bridge. Jenkins, with a pair of binoculars to his eyes, inspecting a receding steamer on the horizon. The others passing comments. All had agreed that she was a merchant craft, 
the first they had met at close quarters. But not all were agreed that she carried no wireless equipment. Jenkins, even with the glasses, could not be sure. But he was sure of one thing, he asserted. Even though the steamer had recognized and reported their position, it made little difference. Well, said Forsyth, if she can report us, why can't we? Why can't we fake a report? Send out a message that we've been seen a thousand miles north. That's a good idea, said Casey, the wireless man off duty. We needn't give any name, only a jumble of letters that spell nothing. How far can you send with what you've got? asked Jenkins. With those aerials, answered Casey, glancing aloft at the long gridiron of wire. About fifty miles. Not much good, I'm afraid, said Jenkins. Lord knows where we are, but we're more than fifty miles from land. That as far as you can reason? Broke in Forsyth. Jenkins, you're handy at a knockdown. But if you can't use what brains you've got, you'd better resign command here. I don't know who elected you anyhow. Are you looking for more, Forsyth? Asked Jenkins, taking a step toward him. If you are, you can have it. If not, get down to your studies and find out where this craft is so we can get somewhere. Forsyth. Hiding his emotions under a forced grin, retreated toward the forehatch. I can give you the latitude, he said before descending, by a meridian observation this noon. I picked up the method in one lesson this morning. But I tell you, fellows, I'm tired of getting knocked down. Jenkins watched him descend, then said to Casey, Pick up a message claiming to be from some ship with a jumbled name, as you say, and be ready to send it if it gets a position. Then you think well of it? Certainly. Forsyth has brains. The only trouble with him is that he wants to run things too much. Casey, a smooth-faced, keen-eyed Irish-American, descended to consult with his confrere, Munson and Forsyth appeared, swinging a book. Laying this on the bridge stairs, he passed Jenkins and walked aft. Where are you going? asked the latter. Forsyth turned, white with rage, and answered slowly and softly, down to the officer's quarters to get a sextant or a quadrant. I found that book on navigation in the pilot house but I need the instrument and a nautical almanac. That is as far as my studies have progressed. You stay out of the officer's quarters, said Jenkins. There's a man there that'll eat you alive if you show yourself. You want a sextant and a nautical almanac? Anything else? That is all. I'll get them. And remember... You and the rest are to stay away from the after end of the boat. Forsyth made no answer as Jenkins passed him on the way aft, but muttered, Eat me alive? We'll see. Riley, one of the machinists, appeared from the engine room hatch and came forward, halting before Forsyth. Say, he grumbled, what caused that big lobster to bullyrag this crowd the way he's been doing? I heard him just now giving you hell. And he gave me hell yesterday when I spoke with his short oil. Short oil? queried Forsyth. Do you mean that? I mean that the oil won't last but a day longer. We've been storming along at 40 knots and eating up oil. What'll we do? God knows answered Forsyth reflectively. With that oil, we stop in mid-ocean. 
What then? What then? queried Riley. Well, before then we must hold up some craft and get the oil. Also grub and water if I guess right. This bunch is hard on the commissary. Riley, said Forsyth impressively, will you stand by me? Yes, if we bring that big chump to terms. All right. Talk to your partners. Something must be done, and he can't do it. Wait a little. As though to verify Riley and uphold him in his contention, Daniels, the cook, came forward from the gallery and said, Just about one week's whack of grub and water left. I'll have to go on an allowance. Then he passed on, but was called back. One week's grub left, asked Forsyth. Sure of that, Daniels? Surest thing you know. Plenty of beans and hardtack, but who wants beans and hardtack? Have you spoken to Jenkins about it? No, but we meant to. Something's got to be done. Where is he now? Down aft, said Forsyth reflectively. What's keeping him? Riley sank into the engine room, and Daniels went forward to the forecastle, reappearing before Forsyth had reached a conclusion. Come aft with me, Daniels, he said. Let's find out what's doing. Together, they crept aft and peered down the wardroom skylight. They saw Demon and Jenkins locked in furious embrace and watched while Jenkins sat down, helpless and impotent. They saw Demon bind him, disappear from sight, and reappear with the irons. Then they listened to his parting lecture to Jenkins. Come, said Forsyth. Down below with us, quick. They descended the galley companion, from which a passage led aft to the petty officer's quarters, which included the arm room, and thence to the forward door of the wardroom. Here they halted and listened to Demon's movements while he armed himself and climbed the companion stairs. They could also see through the keyhole. He's healed, cried Forsyth. Where did he get the guns? Where's the arm room? Here about somewhere. Where is it? They hurriedly searched and found the arm room. It contained cumbersome rifles, cutlasses, and warheads, but no pistols. He's removed them all. Can we break in that door? asked Forsyth, rushing toward the bulkhead. Nah, hold on, said Daniels. We'll watch from the companion, and when he's forward, we'll sneak down the other and heal ourselves. Good. So while Demon crept up and walked forward, glancing right and left, the two watched him from the galley hatch, and, after he had bound the two engineers and the helmsman, they slipped aft and descended the wardroom stairs. Here they looked at Jenkins, vainly trying to speak, but ignored him for the present. They hurried through the quarters and finally found Denman's room with his arsenal of loaded revolvers. They belted and armed themselves and carefully climbed the steps just in time to see Denman drive the forecastle contingent to the deck. Then Forsyth, taking careful aim, sent the bullet which knocked Denman unconscious to the deck. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 8 Forsyth and Daniels ran forward, while Billings, the cook-off watch, followed from the galley hatch, and Casey came up from the wireless room. Each asked questions, 
but nobody answered at once. There were eight bound men lying upon the deck, and these must first be released, which was soon done. Denman, lying prone with a small pool of blood near his head, was next examined and pronounced alive. He was breathing, but dazed and shocked, for a large caliber bullet glancing upon the skull has somewhat the same effect as the blow of a cudgel. He opened his eyes as the men examined him, and dimly heard what they said. Now, said Forsyth, when these preliminaries were concluded, here we are, miles at sea, with short store of oil, according to Riley, and a short store of grub, according to Daniels. What's to be done, eh? The man who has bossed us so far hasn't seen this and is now down in the wardroom, knocked out by this brass-button doodling. What are you going to do, hey? Forsyth flourished his pistols dramatically and glared unspeakable things at the doodling on the deck. Well, Forsyth, said old Kelly, the gunner's mate, you've pretended to be a navigator. What do you say? I say this, declared Forsyth. I'm not a navigator, but I can be. But I want it understood. There has got to be a leader, a commander. If you fellows agree, I'll master the navigation and take this boat to the African coast. But I want no halfway work. I want my orders to go, just as I give them. Do you agree? You've gone wrong under Jenkins. Take your choice. You're right, Forsyth, said Casey, the wireless man of the starboard watch. Jenkins is too easy, too careless. Take the job, I say. Do you all agree? yelled Forsyth wildly in his excitement. Yes, yes, they exclaim. Take charge and get us out of these seas. Who wants to be locked up? All right, said Forsyth, Then I'm the commander. Lift that baby down to the skipper's room with the sick woman and let them nurse each other. Lift Jenkins out of the wardroom and stow him in the forecastle bunk. Riley, nurse your engines and save oil, but keep the dynamo going for the wireless. And you, Casey, have you got that message cooked up? I have. All I want is the latitude and the longitude to send it from. I'll give it to you soon. Get busy now and do your share. I must study a little. The meeting adjourned. Denman, still dazed with a splitting headache, was assisted aft and below to the spare berth in the captain's quarters, where he sank into unconsciousness with the moaning of the stricken woman in his ears. Casey went down to his partner and his instruments. Riley and King, with their confreres of the other watch, went down to the engines to nurse them. And Forsyth, after Jenkins had been lifted out of the wardroom and forward to the forecastle bunk, searched the bookshelves and the desks of the officers, and, finding what he wanted, went forward to study. He was apt. He was a high school graduate who only needed to apply himself to produce results. And Forsyth produced them. As he had promised, he took a meridian observation that day, and in half an hour announced the latitude. 35 degrees, 40 minutes north. Now Casey, he called, after he had looked at the track chart. Got your fake message ready? Only this, answered Casey scanning a piece of paper. Listen. Stolen destroyer bound north. Latitude so-and-so. Longitude so-and-so. That'll do, or anything like it. Send it from latitude 40 north, 55 west. That's up close to the corner of the lanes. And if it's caught up, 
It'll keep them busy up there for a while. What's our longitude? Don't know. And won't until I learn the method. But just north of us is the west to east track of outbound, low-power steamers. Which, I take it, means tramps and tankers. Well, we'll have good use for a tanker. You mean we'll hold up one for oil? Of course. And for grub if we need it. Piracy, Forsyth. Have pirates got anything on us now? asked Forsyth. What are we? Mutineers? Convicts? Strong arm men? Thieves? Or just simply pirates? Off the deck with you, Casey, and keep your wires hot. Forty north, forty five west for a while. Then we'll have it farther north. Casey jotted down the figures and departed to the wireless room where, at intervals throughout the day, he sent out into the ether the radiating waves, which, if picked up within 50 miles by a craft beyond the horizon, might be relayed on. The success of this scheme cannot be learned by any tangible signs, but for the next few days, while the boat lay with wide engines and foresight studied navigation, they remarked that they were not pursued or noticed by passing craft. And as the boat, with dead engines, rolled lazily in the long Atlantic swell, while the men, all but Forsyth, the two cooks, and the two wireless experts, lolled lazily about the deck, the three invalids of the ship's company were convalescing in different degrees. Jenkins, dumb and wheezy, lay prone in the forecastle bunk, trying to wonder how it happened. His mental faculties, though apprising him that he was alive, would hardly carry him to the point of wonder, for wonder predicates imagination, and what little Jenkins was born with had been shocked out of him. Still he struggled, and puzzled, and guessed weakly as to what had happened to him. And when a committee from the loungers above visited him and asked him what struck him, he could only point suggestively to his throat and wag his head. He could not even whisper. And so they left him, pondering over the profanely expressed opinion of old Kelly that it was a visitation from God. The committee went aft to the skipper's quarters, and here loud talk and profanity ceased, for there was a woman below. And, while these fellows were not gentlemen, as the term is understood, they were men. Bad men, but men. On the way down the stairs, Kelly struck, barehanded, his watchmate Hawks for expressing an interest in the good looks of the woman. And Samson, a giant like his namesake, smote old Kelly, hip and thigh, for qualifying his strictures on the common of Hawks. Thus corrected and enjoined, with caps in hand, they approached the open door of the starboard room, where lay the injured woman in the berth, fully clothed in her now-dried garments, and her face still hidden in Denman's bandage. Excuse me, madam, said Samson, the present chairman of the committee. Can we do anything for you? I cannot see you, she answered faintly. I did not know where I am, nor what will happen to me. But I am in need of attention. One man was kind to me, but he has not returned. Who are you, you men? We're a crew of the boat, answered Samson awkwardly. The skipper's forward, and I guess the man that was kind to you is our prisoner. He's not on the job now, but... What can we do? Tell me where I am and where I'm going. What boat is this? Who are you? Well, madam, broke in old Kelly. We're a crowd of jailbreakers that stole a torpedo boat destroyer 
and put to sea. We got you off a burn and sinking yacht, and you're here with us. But I'm blessed if I know what we'll do with you. Our necks are in the halter, so to speak. Or rather, our hands and ankles are in irons for life if we're caught. You've got to make the best of it until we get caught. And if we don't, you've got to make the best of it too. Lots of young men among us. And you're no spring chicken by the looks of you. Old Kelly went down before a fist of blows from Hawks, who thus strove to rehabilitate himself in the good opinion of his mates. And Hawks went backward from a blow from Samson, who, as yet unsullied from unworthy thought, held his position as peacemaker and moralist. And while they were recovering from the excitement, Denman, with blood on his face from the wound in his scalp, appeared among them. Are you fellows utterly devoid of manhood and self-respect, he said sternly, that you appear before the door of a sick room and bait a woman who cannot defeat herself even by speech? Shame upon you. You have crippled me, but I am recovering. If you cannot aid this woman, leave her to me. She is burned, scalded, disfigured. She hardly knows her name or where she came from. You have saved her from the wreck, and have since neglected her. Men, you are jailbirds as you say, but you are American seamen. If you cannot help her, leave her. Do not insult her. I am helpless. If I had power, I would decree further relief from the medicine chest. But I am a prisoner. Restricted. Samson squared his big shoulders. On deck with you fellas. All of you. Get. Quick. They followed up the companion, leaving Samson looking at Denman. Lieutenant, he said. You take care of this poor woman, and if anyone interferes, notify me. I'm as big a man as Jenkins, who's knocked out and a bigger man than Forsyth, who's now in command. But we're fair, understand? We're fair, the most of us. Yes, yes, answered Denman, as he staggered back to a transom seat. Want anything yourself? asked Samson, as he noted the supine figure of Denman. You're still Lieutenant Denman of the Navy. Understand? No, I do not. Leave me alone. Samson followed his mates. Demon sat out a few moments, nursing his aching head and trying to adjust himself to conditions. And as he sat there, he felt a hand on his shoulder and heard a weak voice saying, Are you Lieutenant Demon? Billy Demon? He looked up. The bandaged face of the woman was above him. Out of the folds of the bandage looked two serious, gray eyes, and he knew them. Flory, he said in a choke. Is this you? Grown up? Flory Fleming! How? Why? What brings you here? I started on the trip, Billy, she said calmly, with father on a friend's yacht bound for the Bermudas. We caught fire, and I was the only one saved, it seems. But how are you here, subordinate to these men? Are you injured, Billy? You're bleeding. What has happened? The finger of fate, Flory, or the act of God answered Denman with a painful smile. We must have the conceit taken out of us on occasions, you know. Forsyth, my schoolmate, is in command of this crowd of jailbreakers and pirates. Forsyth? Your conqueror? She receded a step. 
<laughs> Do you know, Mr. Demon, that you were my hero when I was a child? And that I never forgave Jack Forsyth? I had hoped to hear. Oh, I know, he interrupted hotly, while his head throbbed anew with a surge of emotion. I know what you and the whole town expected. But, well, I knocked them down on deck a short time back, and the knockdown stands. But they would not allow a finish. Then he shot me when I was not looking. I am glad, she answered simply, for your sake, and perhaps for my own. For I, too, it seems, am in his power. He answered her as he could, incoherently and meaninglessly. But she went to her room and closed the door. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 9 Down the wardroom companion came Forsyth, followed by Samson, who edged alongside of him as he peered into the after compartment, where Denman sat on the transom. What do you want down here with me? asked Forsyth in a snarl as he looked sidewise at Samson. To see that you act like a man, answered the big machinist. There's a sick woman here. And a more or less sick man, answered Forsyth. That if I hadn't made sick, would have had you in irons. Get up on deck. All I want is a chronometer. Under the circumstances, rejoined Samson coolly. Though I acknowledge your authority as far as governing this crew is concerned, when it comes to a sick woman, defended only by a wounded officer, I shift to the jurisdiction of the officer. If Lieutenant Demon asks that I go on deck, I will go. Otherwise, I remain. Wait, said Denman weakly, for you have lost much blood. Perhaps Forsyth need not be antagonized or coerced. Forsyth, do you remember a little girl at home named Flory Fleming? Well, that woman is she. I appeal to whatever is left of your boyhood ideals to protect this woman and care for her. Yes, I remember her, answered Forsyth, with a bitter smile. She thought you were a tin god on wheels, and told me after you'd gone that you'd come back and thrash me. You didn't, did you? His speech ended in a sneer. No, but I will when the time comes, answered Denman. But the mental transition from pity to anger overcame him, and he sank back. Now, this is neither here nor there, Forsyth said Samson sternly. You want a chronometer. When you get it, you have no more business here than I have. I think you better use your authority like a man, or I'll call a meeting of the boys. Of course, answered Forsyth, looking at the big shoulders of Samson. But inasmuch as I knew this fellow from boyhood, and knew this girl when I was a child, the best care I can give her is to remove this chap from her vicinity. We'll put him down the forepeak, and let one of the cooks feed her and nurse her. We'll see about that on deck, said Samson indignantly. I'll talk. Yes, broke in Denman, standing up. Forsyth is right. It is not fitting that I should be here alone with her. Put me anywhere you like, but take care of her as you are men and Americans. Forsyth made no answer, but Samson gave Denman a troubled, doubtful look, then nodded and followed Forsyth to the various rooms until he had secured what he wanted. Then they went on deck together. But in an hour, 
they were back. And, though Deadman had heard nothing of a conclave on deck, he judged by their faces that there had been one, and that if Forsyth had been overruled by the influence of Samson. For Samson smiled, and Forsyth scowled, as they led Deadman into the wardroom to his own berth, and locked him in with the assurance that cooks would feed him and attend to the wants of himself and the woman. Billings had come with arnica, plaster, and bandages, and roughly dressed his wound. But he gave them no information of their plans. However, Denman could still look out through a deadlight. A few hours after the boat's engines had started, he could see a steamer on the horizon, steering a course that would soon intercept with that of the destroyer. She was a one-funneled, two-masted craft. A tramp, possibly. A working boat, surely. But he only learned when her striped funnel came to view that she belonged to a regular line. She made no effort to avoid them, but held on until within hailing distance, when he heard Forsyth's voice from the bridge. Steamer ahoy! he shouted. What's your cargo? Oil, answered the man on the steamer's bridge. What are you holding me up for? Oil, answered Forsyth. How is it stowed? In cases or in bulk? In bulk, you doggone fool. Very good. We want some of that oil. You do, hey? Who are you? You look like that runaway destroyer I've heard so much about. Who's going to recompense the company for the oil you want? Hey, where do I come in? Who pays the bill? Send it to the United States government or send it to the devil. Pass a hose over the side and dip your end in a tank. Suppose I said no. Well, we'll send a few shells into your water line. Is that straight? Are you pirates that would sink a working craft? As far as you're concerned, we are. Pass over your hose and stop talking about it. All we want is a little oil. Will you give me a written receipt? Of course. Name your bill. We'll toss it up in the drift boat. Pass over the hose. All right. Hook up your own reducer and suck it full with your pump. Then it will siphon down. Got reducers, Samson? Got several. Guess we can start the flow. The two craft drew close together. The hose was flung from the tanker to the destroyer, and the four machinists worked for a while with wrenches and pump fittings until the connection was made. Then they started the pump filled the hose, and, disconnecting, dropped their end into the tanks. The oil, by the force of gravity, flowed from one craft to the other until the gauges showed a full supply. Then a written receipt for 125 tons of oil was signed by the leaders, tied to a piece of iron, and tossed aboard the tanker. Then the two craft separated the pirate heading south, as Denman could see by the telltale. Denman, his wounded scalp easier, lay down in his berth and smoked while he thought out his plans. Obviously, the men were pirates, fully committed. They would probably repeat their performance, and as obviously, they would surely be caught in time. There was nothing he can do except to heal his wound and wait. He could not even assist Miss Flory, no matter what peril might menace her. Then, as he remembered a bunch of duplicate keys given him when he joined his executive officer, he thought that perhaps he might. They were in his desk, and, rolling out, he secured them. He tried them in turn on his door lock and finally found the one that fitted. 
This he took off the ring and secured with his own bunch of keys. Placing the others, which he easily surmised belonged to all the locking doors in the boat, in another pocket. Then he lay back to finish his smoke. But Samson opened his door and interrupted. You'll excuse me, sir, he began, while Devin peered critically at him through the smoke. But I suppose you know what we've just done. Yes, she answered. I could see a little and hear more. You've held up and robbed an old steamer. And is it piracy, sir, in the old sense? A hanging matter if we're caught? Hardly no, said Deadman, after a moment's reflection. Laws are repealed every now and then. Did you kill anyone? No, sir. Well, I judge that a pirate at sea is about on the same plane as a burglar on shore. If he kills anyone while committing a felony, he's guilty of murder in the first degree. Better not kill any fellow men. Then you'll only get a long term. Perhaps for life, when you're nabbed. Thank you, Mr. Denman. They're talking big things on deck, but there'll be no killing. Foresight is something of a devil and will stop at nothing. But I'll... Pardon me, said Denman lazily. He'll stop at me if you release me. Not yet, sir. It may be necessary, but at present, we're thinking of ourselves. All right. But tell me, how did you get a key to my door? How many keys are there? Oh, from Billings, sir. Not with Forsyth's knowledge, however. Billings and some others think no more of him than I do. That's right, responded Denman. I knew him at school. Look out for him. By the way, is the lady aft being attended to? Yes, sir. Daniels, the other cook, brings her what she needs. She is not locked up, though. That's good. Give her the run of the deck and take care of her. Yes, sir, we will, answered Samson, as respectfully as though it were a legitimate order, for force of habit is strong. Then he left the room, locking the door behind him. Denman smoked until he had finished the cigar, and, after he had eaten a supper brought by Billings, he smoked again until darkness closed down. And with the closing down of darkness came a plan. End of Chapter 9、Chapter 10 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 10 Tossing his cigar through the open deadlight, Denman arose and unlocked his door, passing into the small and empty wardroom. First, he tried the forward door leading into the petty officer's quarters and to the arm room. And Finding it locked, sought for the key which opened it, and passed through, closing the door softly behind him. Farther forward, he could hear the voice of Billings singing cheerfully to himself in the galley, and, filtering through the galley hatch and open deadlights, the voice of Forsyth uttering angry commands to someone on deck. He had no personal design upon Billings. Nor at present upon Forsyth. So he searched the arm room. As Forsyth and Daniels had found, there was nothing there more formidable than cutlasses, rifles, and torpedo heads. The pistols had been removed to some other place. So Demon went back and searched the wardroom, delving into closets and receptacles looking for arms. But he found none. And sat down on the chair to think. Presently he arose 
and tapped on the glazed glass door of the captain's apartment. Flory, he said in a half whisper. Flory, are you awake? There was no answer for a moment. Then he saw a shadow move across the door. Flory, he repeated. Are you awake? Who is this? came an answering whisper through the door. Denman. Billy Denman, he answered. If you are awake and clothed, let me in. I have a key, and I want to talk with you. All right. Yes. Come in. But I have no key, and the door is locked. Denman quickly found the key and opened the door. She stood there, with her face still tied up in claws, and only her gray eyes showing in the light from the electric bulbs of the room. Flory, he said, will you do your part towards helping us out of our present trouble? I'll do what I can, Billy, but I cannot do much. You can do a lot, he responded. Just get up on deck with your face tied up and walk around. Speak to any man you meet and go forward to the bridge. Ask anyone you see any question you like as to where we are going or what is to be done with us. Anything at all which will justify your presence on deck. Just let them see that you are on deck and will be on deck again. Will you, Flory? My face is still very bad, Billy, and the wind cuts like a knife. Why must I go up among those men? I'll tell you afterward. Go along, Flory. Just show yourself and come down. I am in the dark. Why do you not tell me what is ahead? I would rather stay here and go to bed. You can go to bed in ten minutes said Denman. But go up first and show yourself, and come down. I will do the rest. Well, Billy, I will. I do not like to, but you seem to have some plan which you do not tell me of. So, well, all right, I'll go up. She put on a cloak and ascended the companion stairs, and Denman sat down to wait. He heard nothing, not even a voice of congratulation, and after a few moments, Flory came down. I met them all, she said, and they were civil and polite. What more do you want of me, Billy? Your cloak, your hat, and your skirt. I will furnish the bandage. What? Exactly. I will go up dressed like you and catch them unawares, one by one. But Billy, they will kill you or hurt you. Don't do it, Billy. Now here, Flory girl, he answered firmly. I'll go into the wardroom and you toss in the materials for my disguise. Then you go to bed, and if I get into trouble, they will return the clothes. But suppose they kill you. I will be at their mercy. Billy, I am alone here without you. Flory, they are sailors. That means they are men. If I win, you are all right, of course. Now let me have the things. I want to get command of this boat. Take them, Billy. But return to me and tell me. Don't leave me in suspense. I won't. I'll report, Flory. Just wait and be patient. He passed into the wardroom, and soon the skirt, hat, and cloak were thrown to him. He had some trouble in donning the garments, for, while the length of the skirt did not matter, the width certainly did and he must needs piece out the waistband the length of the string, ruthlessly punching holes to receive it. 
The cloak was a tight squeeze for his broader shoulders, but he managed it, and after he had thoroughly masked his face with bandages, he tried the hat. There were hatpins sticking to it, which he knew the utility of. But, as she furnished him nothing of her thick crown of hair, he jabbed these through the bandage and surveyed himself in the skipper's large mirror. Most ladylike, he muttered, squinting through the bandages. Then he went on deck. His plan had progressed no further than this to be able to reach the deck unrecognized so that he can watch, listen to the talk, and decide what he might do later on. Billings still sang cheerily in the galley, and the voices forward were more articulate. Chiefly concerned, it seemed, with the replenishing of the water and food supply, and the necessity of Forsythe's pursuing his studies so that they can know where they were. The talk ended by their driving their commander below, and when the watches were set, Demon himself went down. He descended as he had come up, by the captain's companion, reported his safety to Flory through the partly open stateroom door, and also requested that, each night as she retired, she should toss the hat, cloak, and skirt into the wardroom. To this she agreed, and he discarded the uncomfortable rig and went to his room locking the captain's door behind him, also his own. His plan had not progressed. He had only found a way to see things from the deck instead of through a deadlight, and he went to sleep with the troubled thought that, even though he should master them all, as he had once nearly succeeded in doing, he would need to release them in order that they should work ship. To put them on parole was out of the question. The sudden stopping of the turbines awoke him in the morning, and the sun shining into his deadlight apprised him that he had slept late. He looked out and ahead, and saw a large, white steam yacht resting quietly on the rolling groundswell, apparently waiting for the destroyer to creep up to her. Another hold-up, he said. And for grub and water this time, I suppose. Wishing to see this from the deck, he rushed aft to the captain's room and tapped on the door, meanwhile fumbling for his keys. There was no answer, and, tapping again, he opened the door and entered. Flory, he called in a whisper. Are you awake? She did not reply, but he heard Samson's voice from the deck. This is your chance, miss, he said. We're going to get stores from that yacht, but no doubt she'll take you on board. Is she bound to New York, or some port where I may reach friends? asked the girl. No, bound to the Mediterranean. Will you release Mr. Denman as well? No, I'm pretty sure the boys will not. He knows our plans, and is a naval officer, you see with a strong interest in landing us. Once on shore, he would have every warship in the world after us. Then I stay here with Mr. Denman. He is wounded, and is my friend. Denman was on the point of calling up, to insist that she leave the yacht. But he thought, in time, that it would reveal his position, and leave him more helpless. While. Perhaps, she might still refuse to go. He heard Samson's footsteps going forward and called to her softly. But she, too, had moved forward. And he went back to his deadlight. It was a repetition of the scene with the oil steamer. Forsyth, loudly and profanely announcing his wants and calling the yacht's attention to two 12-pounders aimed at her waterline. She was of the standard type, clipper-bowed, square stern, with one funnel and two masts. And from the trucks of these masks stretched a three-wire grid of a wireless outfit. Forward was a crowd of blue-clad sailors. 
On the bridge, an officer and a helmsman. And aft, on the fantail, a number of guests. While amidships, conversing earnestly, were two men, whose dress indicated that they were the owner and sailing master. In the door of a small deck house near them stood another man in uniform. And to this man the owner turned and spoke a few words. The man disappeared inside. And Denman, straining his ears, heard the rasping sound of a wireless sender. And simultaneously, Casey's warning shout to Forsyth. He's calling for help, Forsyth. Stop him! Then came Forsyth's vibrant voice. Call that man out of the wireless room, he yelled, or we'll send a shell into it. Train that gun, Kelly, and stand by for the word. Call him out, he continued. Stop that message. The rasping sound ceased, and the operator appeared. Then, with their eyes distended, the three ran forward. Anyone else in that deck house? called Forsyth. No, answered the sailing master. What are you going to do? Kelly, said Forsyth. Aim low and send a shell into the house. Aim low so as to smash the instruments. Kelly's reply was inarticulate, but in a moment the gun barked and the deck house disintegrated into a tangle of kindling from which oozed a cloud of smoke. Women screamed, and forward and aft, the yacht's people crowded toward the ends of the craft. What in thunder are you trying to do? roared the sailing master, shaking his fist. Are you going to sink us? Not unless necessary, replied Forsyth. But we want grub. Good grub, too. And water. We want water through your own hose, because ours is full of oil. Do you agree? It was a short confab between the owner and the sailing master, ending with the latter's calling out, We'll give you water and grub, but don't shoot any more hardware at us. Come closer and throw a heaving line, and send your boat, if you like, for the grub. Our boats are all lashed down. That's reasonable, answered Forsyth. Hawks, Davis, Daniels, Billings. You fellows clear away that boat of ours and stand by to go for the grub. The two craft drew together, and for the rest, it was like the other hold up. The hose was passed, and while the tanks were filling, the boat passed back and forth, making three trips heavily laden with barrels, packages, and boxes. Then, when Forsyth gave the word, the hose was drawn back, the boat hoisted and secured, and the two craft separated without another word of threat or protest. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 11 Fully committed, muttered Denman as he drew back from the deadlight. They'll stop at nothing now. He was about to open his door to visit Flory, if she had descended, when it was opened from without by Billings, who had brought his breakfast. I'll have better grub in a while, sir, he said, as he deposited the tray on the desk. Suppose you know what happened? Yes, and I see life imprisonment for all of you, unless you are killed in the catching. Can't help it, sir, answered Billings with a deprecatory grin. We're not going back to jail, nor will we starve on the high seas. All we're waiting for is the course to the African coast. Unless, he paused. Unless what? demanded Denman, 
leaning over his breakfast. Well, unless the vote is to stay at sea. We've got a good, fast boat under us. What do you mean? Continued piracy? I can't tell you any more, sir, answered Billings as he went off, after carefully locking the door behind him. When Denman had finished his breakfast, he quietly let himself out. Tapping on the after door, he saw Flory's shadow on the translucent glass and opened it. She stood before him with the bandages removed, and he saw her features for the first time since she had come aboard. They were pink, and here there was a blister that had not yet disappeared. But, even so handicapped, her face shone with a beauty that he had never seen in the woman, nor imagined in the grown-up child that he remembered. The large, serious, gray eyes were the same, but the short, dark ringlets had developed to a wealth of hair that would have suitably crowned a queen. Denman stood transfixed for a moment, then found his tongue. Flory, he said softly, so as not to be heard from above. Is this really you? I wouldn't have known you. Yes, I know, she answered with a smile, which immediately changed to a little grimace of pain. I was badly scalded, but I had to take off the cloth to eat my breakfast. No, he said, I didn't mean that. I mean, you've improved so. Why, Flory, you've grown up to be a beauty. I never imagined you, you looking so fine. Don't talk like that, Billy Denman. I'm disfigured for life, I know. I can never show my face again. Nonsense, Flory. The redness will go away. But tell me, why didn't you go aboard that yacht? I overheard you talking to Samson. Why didn't you go and get away from this bunch? I have just told you, she answered, while a hint overspread her pink face that did not come out of the scalding. There were women on that yacht. Do you think I want to be stared at and pitied and laughed at? I never thought of that, said Denman. But I suppose it is a very vital reason for a woman. Yet, it's too bad. This boat is sure to be captured, and there may be gunfire. It's a bad place for you. But, Flory, let me tell you. Did you see what came on board from the yacht? Boxes, and barrels, and the water. Yes, and some of those boxes contain whiskey and brandy. Whiskey and brandy make men forget that they are men. Have you a key for your door? No, I never saw one. Denman tried his bunch of keys on the stateroom door until he found the right one. This he took off the ring and inserted it in the lock. Lock your door every time you go in there, he said impressively. And, Flory, another thing. Keep that pretty face of yours out of sight of these men. Go right in there now and replace the bandages. Then, after a while, about nine o'clock, go on deck for a walk around, and then let me have your rig. I want a daylight look at things. She acquiesced, and he went back to his room, locking himself in, just in time to escape the notice of Billings, who had come for the tray. Are you fellows going to deprive me of all exercise? He demanded. Even a man in irons is allowed to walk the deck a little. Don't know, sir, answered Billings. Forsyth is the man to talk to. I'll do more than talk to him, growled Denman between his teeth. Carry my request for exercise to him, 
say that I demand the privileges of a convict. Very good, sir, answered Billings as he went out. In a few moments, he was back with the news that Forsyth had profanely denied the request, whereat Denman's heart hardened the more. He remained quiet until two bells, nine o'clock, had struck, then went out and approached the after door, just in time to see Flory's shadow pass across the glass as she mounted the stairs. He waited, and in about five minutes she came down, and, no doubt seeing his shadow on the door, tapped gently. He promptly opened it, and she said, Leave the door open, and I'll throw you my things in a minute. They are drinking up there. Drinking, he mused as he waited. Well... Perhaps I can get a gun if they drink the stupidity. Soon, Flory's hand opened the door, and the garments came through. Denman had little trouble now in donning them, and, with his head tied up as before, he passed through the captain's apartment to the deck. It was a mild, sunshiny morning, with little wind, and that for the northeast. White globes of cloud showed here and there, and Denman knew them from the unmistakable sign of the trade winds. But he was more interested in matters on deck. All hands except Billings, who was singing in the gallery, and Munson, one of the wireless men, were clustered around the forward funnel, and there were several bottles circulating around. Forsyth, with a sextant in his hand, was berating them. Go slow, you infernal ginks, he snarled at them. Or you'll be so drunk in an hour that you won't know your names. Ready in there, Munson? Yes, answered Munson from the pilot house. Forsyth put the sextant to his eye and swept it back and forth for a few moments. Time, he called suddenly, and lowering the sextant, looked in at Munson. Got it? asked Monson. Yes, and have it down in black and white. Forsyth made a notation from the sextant on a piece of paper. Now again, said Forsyth, and again he took a sight, shouted, Time! and made another notation. Then he went into the pilot house, and Munson came out and made the shortest cut to the nearest bottle. He's taken the chronometer sights, mused Denman, and he leaned against the companion hood. Well, he's progressing fast, but there was never a doubt that he is a scholar. He went down, and through a crack of the door obtained Miss Flory's permission to keep the cloak and skirt for the morning, as he wanted to see later how the drinking was progressing. Flory consented, and he went to his room to wait. As he waited, the sounds above grew ominous. Oaths and loud laughter, shouts, whoops and grumblings, mingled with Forsyth's angry voice of command, came down to him through the open deadlight. Soon he heard the thumping of human bodies on deck, and knew there was a fight going on. A fight always appealed to him, and, yielding to this unworthy curiosity, Denman again passed through the captain's quarters, making sure on the way that Flory was locked in and reached the deck. There were two fights in progress. One, a stand-up and knockdown affair near the pilot house. The other, a wrestling match amidships. He could not recognize contestants, and, with the thought that perhaps Forsyth was one of them, stepped forward a few feet to observe. At this moment, Billings, the cheerful Billings, came up the galley hatch, no longer cheerful, but morose of face and menacing of gait, as is usual with this type of man when drunk. He spied Denman in his skirt, cloak, hat, and bandage, and, with a clucking chuckle in his throat and a leering grin on his face, made for him. 
Say, old girl, he said thickly. Let's have a kiss. Denman, anxious about his position and peculiar privilege, backed away. But the unabashed pursuer still pursued and caught him on the companion. He attempted to pass his arm around Denman, but did not succeed. Denman pushed him back a few feet. Then, with the whole weight of his body behind it, launched forth his fist and struck the sailor squarely between the eyes. Billings was lifted off his feet and hurled backwards his whole length before he reached the deck. Then he lay still for a moment, and as he showed signs of life, Denman darted down to the wardroom, where he shed his disguise as quickly as possible. Then he roused Flory, passed the garments into her, warned her to keep her door locked, and went to his own room, locking the doors behind him. He waited and listened, while the shouts and oaths above grew less, and finally silent, though at times he recognized Forsyth's threatening voice. He supposed that by now all of them except Forsyth were stupidly drunk. I was much surprised when, at eight bells, Billings opened the door with his dinner, well-cooked and savory. He was not quite sober, but as sober as a drunken man may become, who was at every nerve, sinew, and internal organ shocked as by the kick of a mule. Bad times on deck, sir, he said. This drinking's all to the bad. He leered comically through his closed and blackened eyelids and tried to smile. But it was too painful, and his face straightened. Why? What has happened? inquired Denman. I heard the row, but couldn't see. Nothing serious, sir, answered Billings, except to me. Say, sir, that woman aft. Keep away from her. Take it from me, sir, she's a bad one. Got a punch like a battering ram. Did you ever get the big end of a handspike jammed into your face by a big man, sir? Well, that's the kind of punch she has. Billings departed, and Demon grinned maliciously while he ate his dinner. And, after Billings had taken away the dishes, with more comments on the woman's terrible punch, Denman went out into the wardroom, intending to visit Miss Flory. A glance overhead stopped him and sent him back. The lubber's point on a telltale marked due west-northwest. End of Chapter 11《Chapter 12 of the Pirates》by Morton Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 12 He sat down to think. Samson had hinted at big things talked about. Billings had spoken of a vote to stay at sea or not. However, there could have been no vote since Billings' last visit because of their condition. But Forsyth had indubitably taken chronometer sights in the morning, and, being most certainly sober, had doubtless worked them out and ascertained the longitude, which, with a meridian observation at noon, would give him the position of the yacht. The big things requiring a vote were all in Forsyth's head, and he had merely anticipated the vote. Not knowing their position himself, except as indicated by the trade wind clouds, Denman can only surmise that a west-northwest course would hit the American coast somewhere between Boston and Charleston. But what they wanted there was beyond his comprehension. He gave up the puzzle at last and visited Flory, finding her dressed, swathed in a bandage, and sitting in the outer apartment reading. Briefly, he explained the occurrences on deck, and, as all was quiet now, asked her to step up and investigate. She did so, and returned. Forsyth is steering, she said. 
and two or three are awake but staggering around, and several others are asleep on the deck. Well, he said hopefully, Forsyth evidently can control himself, but not the others. If they remain drunk, or get drunker, I mean to do something tonight. No use trying now. What will you do, Billy? She asked with concern in her voice. I don't know. I'll only know when I get at it. I hope that Forsyth will load up too. Hello. What's up? Run up, Flory, and look. The engine had stopped, and Forsyth's furious invective could be heard. Flory ran up the steps, peeped out, and returned. He is swearing at someone, she said. So it seems, said Deming. Let me have a look. He ascended and carefully peeped over the companion hood. Forsyth was looking down the engine room hatch, and his voice came clear and distinct as he anathematized the engineers below. Shut off your oil, you drunken mutts, he vociferated. If the whole four of you can't keep steam on the steering gear, shut it off. All of it, I say. Shut off every burner and get into your bunks till you're sober. Then Samson's deep voice rose from the hatch. You'll stop talking like that to me, my lad, before long, he said, or I'll break some of your bones. Shut off the oil, every burner, reiterated Forsyth. We'll drift for a while. Right you are, sang out another voice, which Demon recognized as Dwyer's. And here, you booming crank, take a drink and get into a good humor. Pass it up then, I need a drink by this time, but shut off that oil. Demon saw Forsyth reach down and bring up a bottle, from which took a deep draft. The electric lights slowly dimmed in the cabin, indicating the slowing down of the dynamo engine. Then they went out. Denman descended, uneasy in mind, into the half-darkness of the cabin. He knew, from what he had learned of Forsyth, that the first drink would lead to the second, and the third, and that his example would influence the rest to further drinking. But he gave none of his fears to Flory. He simply bade her go into her room and lock the door. Then he went to his own room against the possible advent of buildings at supper time. But there was no supper for any that evening. Long before the time for it, pandemonium raged above, and the loudest, angriest voice was that of Forsyth. Until, toward the last, Samson's voice rose above it, and, as a dull thud on the deck came to Denman's ears, he knew that his fist had silenced it. Evidently the sleeping men had wakened to further potations, and at last the stumbling feet of some of them approached the stern. Then again King Samson's voice. Come back here, he roared. Keep away from that companion, the lot of you, or I'll give you what I gave Forsyth. A burst of invective and malediction answered him. And then there were the sounds of conflict, even the crashing of fists, as well as the thuds on the deck, coming to Denman through the deadlight. For we all, continued Samson, between the sounds of impact, and soon the shuffling of feet indicated a retreat. Denman, who had opened his door, ready for a rush to Flory's defense now went aft to reassure her. She opened the door at his tap and his voice through the keyhole. It's all right for the present, Flory, he said. While Samson is sober, they won't come aft again. Oh, Billy, she gasped. I hope so. 
Don't desert me, Billy. Don't worry, he said reassuringly. They'll all be stupid before long. And then, tonight, there will be something doing on our side. Now, I must be in my room when Billings comes, or until I'm sure that he will not come. And you stay here. I'll be on hand if anything happens. He went back to his room, but Billings did not come with his supper. And one by one, the voices above grew silent, and their shuffling footsteps ended in thuds as their owners dropped to the deck. And when darkness had closed down, and all above was still, Denman crept out to reconnoiter. He reached the door leading to the captain's room, was just about to open it when a scream came to his ears. Billy! Billy, come! Come quick! Help! Then a tense voice. Shut up your noise in there and open the door. I don't want to have a talk with you. Denman was in the room before the voice had ceased, and in the darkness barely made out the figure of a man fumbling at the knob of the stateroom door. He knew, as much by intuition as by recognition of the voice, that it was Forsyth, and, without a word of warning, sprang in his throat. With an oath, Forsyth gripped him, and they swayed back and forth in a small cabin, locked together in an embrace that strained muscles and sinews to the utmost. Forsyth expended breath and energy in curses. Denman said nothing until Flory screamed again. Then he found voice to call out. All right, Flory, I've got him. She remained silent while the battle continued. At first, it was a wrestling match, each with a right arm around the body of the other, and with Demon's left hand gripping Forsyth's left wrist. Their left hands swayed about, above their heads, to the right, to the left, and down between the close pressure of their chests. Demon soon found that he was the stronger of arm, for he twisted his enemy's arm around as he pleased. But he also found that he was not stronger of fingers, for suddenly... Forsyth broke away from his grip and seized tightly the wrist of Denman. Thus reversed, the battle continued, and as they reeled about, chairs, table, and desk were overturned, making a racket as the combatants stumbled around over and among them that would have aroused all hands had they been but normally asleep. As it was, there was no interruption and the two battled on in the darkness to an end. It came soon. Forsyth suddenly released his clasp on Denman's wrist and gripped his throat. Then as suddenly, he brought his right hand up, and Denman felt the pressure of his thumb to his right eyeball. He was being choked and gouged, and, strangely enough, in this exigency there came to him no thought of the trick by which he had mastered Jenkins. But instead, he mustered his strength, pushed Forsyth from him, and struck out blindly. It was a lucky blow, for his eyes were filled with lights of various hue, and he could not see. Yet his fist caught Forsyth on the chin, and Denman heard him crash back over the upturned table. Forsyth uttered no sound, and when the light had gone out of his eyes, Denman groped for him and found him, just beginning to move. He groaned and sat up. End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 13 No, you don't, said Denman grimly. Fair play is wasted on you, so back you go to the land of Nod. He drew back his right fist and again sent it crashing on the chin of his victim, whom we can just see in the starlight from the companion. 
and Forsyth rolled back. Like Jenkins, he had arrayed himself in an officer's uniform. There was no convenient neckerchief with which to bind him. But Denman took his own and securely tied his hands behind his back, and with another string tie from his room, tied his ankles together. Then only did he think of Flory and call to her. She answered hysterically. It's all right, Flory girl, he said. It was Forsyth, but I've knocked him silly and have him tied hand and foot. Go to sleep now. I can't go to sleep, Billy, she wailed. I can't. Don't leave me alone anymore. I must, Flory, he answered. I'm going on deck to get them all. I'll never have a better chance. Keep quiet and don't come out, no matter what you hear. But come back soon, Billy, she pleaded. I will, soon as I can. But stay quiet in there until I do. He stole softly up the stairs and looked forward. The stars illuminated the deck sufficiently for him to see the prostrate forms scattered about but not enough for him to distinguish one from another until he had crept close. The big machinist, Samson, he found nearest to the companion, as though he had picked this spot to guard, even in drunken sleep, the sacred aftercabin. Demon's heart felt a little twinge of pain as he softly untied and withdrew the big fellow's neckerchief and bound his hands behind him. Samson snored on through the process. The same with the others. Kelly, Daniels, and Billings lay near the afterfall. Munson, Casey, Dwyer, and King were in the scuppers and midships. Riley, Davis, and Hawks were huddled close to the pilot house. And not a man moved in protest as Demon bound them, one and all, with their own neckerchiefs. There was one more, the stricken Jenkins in the forecastle, and Denman descended and examined him by the light of a match. He was awake and blinked and grimaced at Denman, striving to speak. Sorry for you, Jenkins, said Billy. You'll get well in time, but you have to wait. You're harmless enough now, however. There was more to do before he felt secure of his victory. He must tie their ankles, and, as neckerchiefs had run out, he sought, by the light of matches, the bosun's locker in the forepeak. There he found spun yarn, and, cutting off lengths of it, he came up and finished the job, tying knots so hard and seemingly that the strongest fingers of a fellow prisoner could not untie them. Then he went aft. Forsyth was still unconscious, but he regained his senses while Denman dragged him up the steps and forward beside his enemy, Samson. And he emitted various sulfurous comments on the situation that cannot be recorded here. Demon wanted the weapons, but, with engines dead, there was no light save from his very small supply of matches. And for the simple and perhaps very natural desire to save these for his cigar lights. He forbore a search for them beyond an examination of each man's pockets. He found nothing, however. It seemed that they might have agreed upon disarmament before the drinking began. But from Forsyth, he secured a bunch of keys, which he was to find useful later on. All else was well. Each man was bound hand and foot. Jenkins was still a living corpse, and Forsyth, the soberest of the lot, had apparently succumbed to the hard knocks of the day and gone to sleep again. So Denman went down, held a jubilant conversation with Flory through the keyhole, and returned to the deck, where, with a short spanner in his hand, replevin from the engine room for use in case of an emergency, he spent the night on watch. For, with all the lights out, a watch was necessary. 
but nothing happened. The men snored away their drunkenness, and at daylight, most of them were awake and aware of their plight. Devin paid no attention to their questions, but, when the light permitted, went on a search for the arms and irons, which he found in the forecastle, carefully stowed in a bunk. He counted the pistols, and satisfied himself that they were all there. Then he carried them aft to his room, belted himself with one of them, and returned for the cutlasses, which he hid in another room. But the irons he spread along the deck, and, while they cursed and maligned him, he replaced the silk and spun yarn fetters with manacles of steel. Next, he dragged the protesting prisoners from forward and aft until he had them all bunched amidships, and then, walking back and forth before them, delivered a short, comprehensive lecture on the unwisdom of stealing torpedo boat destroyers and getting drunk. Like all lecturers, he allowed his audience to answer, and when he refuted the last argument, he unlocked the irons of Billings and Daniels and sternly ordered them to cook breakfast. They meekly arose and went to the galley, from which, before long, savory odors arose. And, while waiting for breakfast, Demon aroused Miss Flory and brought her on deck, clothed and bandaged, to show her his catch. And what will you do now, Billy? she asked, as she looked at the unhappy men amidships. Haven't the slightest idea. I've got to think it out. I'll have to release some of them to work the boat. And I'll have to shut down and iron them while I sleep, I suppose. I've already freed the two cooks, and we'll have breakfast soon. I'm glad of that, she answered. There was no supper last night. And I'm hungry as a wolf myself. Well, they are hungry too. We'll have our breakfast on deck before they get theirs. Perhaps the sight will bring them to terms. Why cannot I help, Billy? asked the girl. I could watch while you were asleep and wake you if anything happened. Oh no, Flory girl. Of course, I'll throw the stuff overboard, but I wouldn't trust some of them, drunk or sober. Billy soon reported breakfast ready and asked how he should serve the captives. Do not serve them at all, said Demon sharply. Bring the cabin table on deck and place it on the starboard quarter. Serve breakfast for two, and you and Daniels eat your own in the galley. Very good, sir, answered the subdued Billings with a glance at the long blue revolver at Demon's waist. He departed, and with Daniels' help, arranged the breakfast as ordered. Flory was forced to remove her bandage, but as she faced aft at the table, her face was visible to Demon only. He faced forward, and while he ate, he watched the men, who squirmed as the appetizing odors of broiled ham, cornbread, and coffee assailed their nostrils. On each countenance, besides the puffed, bloated appearance coming of heavy and unaccustomed drinking, was a look of anxiety and disquiet. But they were far from being conquered, in spirit at least. Breakfast over, Demon sent Flory below, ordered the dishes and table below, and again put the irons on Billings and Daniels. Then he went among them. What do you mean to do? asked Forsyth surly as Denman looked down on him. Keep us here and starve us? I will keep you in irons while I have the power, answered Denman, no matter what I may do with the others. Samson, he said to the big machinist, you played a man's part last night, and I feel strongly in favor of releasing you on parole. You understand the nature of parole, do you not? I do, sir answered the big fellow thickly. And if I give it, I would stick to it. What are the conditions, sir? 
that you stay and watch, and watch with me while we take this boat back to Boston. That you aid me in keeping this crowd in subjection. That you do your part in protecting the lady aft from annoyance. In return, I promise you my influence at Washington. I have some, and can arouse more. You will, in all probability, be pardoned. No, sir, answered Samson promptly. I am one of this crowd. You are not one of us. I wouldn't deserve a pardon if I went back on my mates, even this dog alongside of me. He's one of us, too. And while I have smashed him, and will smash him again, I will not accept my liberty while he, or any of the others, is in irons. Demon bowed low to him and went on. He questioned only a few, those who seemed trustworthy, but met with the same response. And he left them, troubled in mind. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 14 He sat down in a deck chair and lighted the cigar as an aid to his mental processes. Three projects presented themselves to his mind, each of which included, of course, the throwing overboard of the liquor and the secure hiding of the arms, except a pistol for himself and one for Flory. The first was to release them all, and, backed by his pistol, his uniform, and the power of the government to treat them as mutineers, and shoot them if they defied or disobeyed him. To this was the logical objection that they were already more than mutineers, that there was no future for them, that, even though he overawed and conquered them, compelling them to work the boat shoreward, each passing minute would find them more keen to revolt, and that, if they rushed him in a body, he could only halt a few. The others would master him. The second plan was born of his thoughts before breakfast. It was to release one cook, one engineer, and one helmsman at a time, to guard them until sleep was necessary, then to shut off steam, lock them up, and allow the boat to drift while they slept. Against this plan was the absolute necessity to a seaman's mind of a watch, even a one-man watch, and this one man could work mischief while he slept, could even, if handy with tools, file out a key that would unlock the shackles. The third plan was to starve them to contrition and subjection torturing them the while with the odors of food cooked for himself and Flory. But this was an inhuman expedient, only to be considered as a last resource. And, besides, it would not affect the man doing the cooking. He can keep himself well-fed and obdurate. And, even though they surrendered and worked their way back toward prison, would their surrender last beyond a couple of good meals? He thought not. Yet out of this plan came another, and he went down to the companion. Flory, he called. Can you cook? She appeared at the stateroom door without her bandages, smiling at his query. And for the moment, Demon forgot all about his plans. Though the pink tinge still overspread her face, the blisters were gone, and in the half-light of the cabin, it shone with a new beauty that had not appeared to him in the garish sunlight when at breakfast, when he was intent upon watching the men. His heart gave a sudden jump, and his voice was a little unsteady as he repeated the question. Why, yes, Billy, she answered. I know something about cooking. Not much, though. Will you cook for yourself and me? he asked. If so, I'll keep the men locked up, and we'll wait for something to come along. I will, she said, 
But you must keep them locked up, Billy. I'll do that, and fit you out with a pistol, too. I'll get you one now. He brought her a revolver, fully loaded with a further supply of cartridges, and fitted the belt about her waist. Then, his heart still jumping, he went on deck. Love her? He mused joyously. Of course. Why didn't I think of it before? But there was work to be done, and he set himself about it. He searched the storerooms and inspected the forecastle. In the first, he found several cases of liquor, also a barrel of hard bread. In the forecastle, he found that the water supply was furnished by a small faucet on the after bulkhead. Trying it, he found a clear flow. Then he selected from his bunch of keys the one belonging to the forecastle door and put it in the lock outside. Next, with a few cautionary remarks to the men, he unlocked their wrist irons one by one, and after making each man place his hands in front, relocked the irons. Now then, he said, standing over the last man, you can help yourselves and Jenkins to bread and water. One by one, get up on your feet and pass into the forecastle. If any man needs help, I will assist him. Some managed to scramble to their feet unaided, while others could not. These demon helped, but as he assisted them with one hand, holding his pistol in the other, there was no demonstration against him with doubled fists, which is possible and potential. Mumbling and muttering, they floundered down the small hatch and forward into the forecastle. The last in line was Samson, and Denman stopped him. I have a job for you, Samson, he said after the rest had disappeared. You are the strongest man in the crowd. Go down the hatch, but aft to the storeroom, and get the barrel of hard bread into the forecastle. You can do it without my unlocking you. Very good, sir, answered Samson respectfully, and descended. Demon watched him from above as, with his manacled hands, he twirled the heavy barrel forward and into the men's quarters. Shut the door, turn the key on them, and come aft here, he commanded. Samson obeyed. Now lift up on deck, and then toss overboard every case of liquor in that storeroom. Very good, sir. And up came six cases, as easily in his powerful grip as though they had been bandboxes. Then he hoisted his own huge bulk to the deck. Over the side with them all, commanded Dudman. Samson picked them up, and, whether or not it came from temper, threw them from where he stood, above and beyond the rail. But the fifth struck the rail and fell back to the deck. He advanced and threw it over. Carry the other one, said Denman, and Samson lifted it up. It was a low, skeleton rail, and, as the big man hobbled toward it, somehow, neither he nor Denman ever knew how, his foot slipped, and he and the box went overboard together. The box floated, but when Samson came to the surface, it was out of his reach. Help! he gurgled. I can't swim! Without a thought, Demon laid his pistol on the deck, shed his coat, and dove overboard, reaching the struggling man in three strokes. Keep still, he commanded, as he got behind and secured a light but secure grip on Samson's hair. Tread water if you can, but don't struggle. I'll tow you back to the boat. But, though Samson grew quiet and Denman succeeded in reaching the dark steel side, there was nothing to catch hold of. Not a trailing rope, nor eye bolt, nor even the open deadlights 
for they were high out of reach. The crew were locked in the forecastle, and there was only Flory. There was no wind, and only the long, heaving groundswell, which rolled the boat slightly, but not enough to bring those tantalizing deadlights within reach. And at last, at the sound of dishes rattling the galley, Denman called out. Flory! He shouted. Flory! Come on deck! Throw a rope over! Flory! Oh, Flory! End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 15 She came hurriedly and peered over the rail with a startled, frightened expression. Then she screamed. Can you see any ropes lying on deck, Flory? called Denman. If you can, throw one over. She disappeared for a moment, then came back and cried out frantically. No, there is nothing. No ropes. What shall I do? Go down and get the tablecloth, said Denman, as calmly as he could, with his nose just out of water, and a big, heavy, frightened man bearing him down. Flory vanished and soon reappeared with the tablecloth of the morning's breast. It was a cloth of generous size, and she lowered it over. Tie one corner to the rail, Flory, said Denman while he held the irresponsible Samson away from the still frail support. She obeyed him, tying the knot that all women tie, which no sailor can name, and then Denman led his man up to it. Samson clutched it with both hands, drew it taut, and supported his weight on it. Fortunately, the knot did not slip. Demon also held himself up by it until he had recovered his breath, then cast about for means of getting on board. He felt that the tablecloth would not bear his weight and that of his water soaked clothing, and temporarily gave up the plan of climbing it. Forward were the signal halyards, and they too were of a small line, and even if doubled again and again until strong enough, he knew by experience the wonderful strength of arm required in climbing out of water hand over hand. This thought also removed the tablecloth from the problem, but suggested another by its association with the necessity of feet in climbing with wet clothes. He remembered that forward, just under the anchor davit, was a small fixed ladder, bolted into the bow of the boat for use in getting the anchor. So, cautioning Samson not to let go, he swam forward with Flory's frightened face following above, and, reaching the ladder, easily climbed on board. He was on the high forecastle deck, but the girl had reached it before him. Billy! she exclaimed as she approached him. Oh, Billy! He caught her just as her face grew white and her figure limp, and forgot Samson for the moment. The kisses he planted on her lips and cheek forestalled the fainting spell, and she roused herself. I thought you would drown, Billy, she said weakly, with her face of a deeper pink than he had seen. Don't drown, Billy. Don't do that again. Don't leave me alone. I won't, Flory, he answered, stoutly and smilingly. I'm born to be hanged, you know. I won't drown. Come on, I must get Samson. They descended, Devin picking up his pistol on the way, and found Samson quietly waiting at the end of the tablecloth. 
with his life temporarily safe, his natural courage had come to him. I'm going to tell you forward to the anchor ladder, Samson. You'll have to climb it the best way you can, for there isn't a purchase on board that will bear your weight. Hold tight now. He untied Flory's knot and slowly dragged the big man forward, experiencing a check at the break of the forecastle, where he had to halt and piece out the tablecloth with a length of signal halyards. But finally, Samson got to the ladder. Samson had some trouble in mounting, for his shackles would not permit one hand to reach up to a rung without letting go with the other. But he finally accomplished the feat and floundered over the rail where he sat on deck to recover himself. Finally, he scrambled to his feet. Mr. Denman, he said, you've saved my life for me. Whatever I can do for you, except... His face took on a look of embarrassment. Except going back on my mates. As I said, I would do at any time of my life. That was what I might have suggested, answered Denman calmly, that you aid me in controlling this crew until we reach Boston. I cannot, sir. There is prison for life for all of us if we are taken, and this crowd will break out, sir. Mark my words. You won't have charge very long. But, in that case, I mean, I might be of service. I can control them all, even Forsyth, when I'm awake. Forsyth, grinned Denman. You can thank Forsyth for your roundup. If he hadn't remained sober enough to attempt to break into Miss Fleming's room while you were all dead drunk, I might not have knocked him out, and might not have roused myself to tie you all hand and foot. Did he do that, sir? asked Samson his rugged features darkening. He did, but I got there in time to knock him out. Well, sir, said Samson, I can promise you this much. I must be locked up, of course, I realize that. But if we again get charge, I must be asleep part of the time, and so I will see to it that you retain possession of your gun. And the lady, too. As I see she carries one. Also, sir, that you will have the run of the deck. On parole, of course. That is kind of you, smiled Denman. But I don't mean to let you take charge. It is bread and water for you all until something comes along to furnish me a crew. Come on, Samson, to the forecastle. Samson preceded him down the steps, down the hatch, and to the forecastle door, through which Denman admitted him, then relocked the door and bunched the key with the others. Then he joined Flory, where she had awaited amidships. Now then, Flory girl, he said jubilantly, you can have the use of the deck and go and come as you like. I'm going to turn in. You see, I was awake all night. Are they secured safely, Billy? She asked tremulously. Got them all in the forecastle, in double irons, with plenty of hardtack and water. We needn't bother about them any more. Just keep your eyes open for a sail, or smoke on the horizon. And if you see anything, call me. I will, she answered, and I'll have dinner ready at noon. That's good. A few hours sleep will be enough, and I'll try and polish up what I once learned about wireless. And say, Flory, next time you go below, look in the glass and see how nice you look. She turned her back to him, and he went down. In five minutes, he was asleep, and as he slipped off into unconsciousness, there came to his mind the thought that one man in the forecastle was not manacled, 
and when Flory wakened him at noon, the thought was still with him, but he dismissed it. Jenkins was helpless for a while, unable to move or speak, and need not be considered. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 16 Flory had proven herself a good cook, and they ate dinner together. Then Denman went on deck. The boat was still rolling on a calm sea, but the long, steady, low-moving hills of blue were now mingled with a cross-swell from the northwest, which indicated the push from beyond the horizon, not connected with the trade wind. And in the west, a low bank of cloud rose up from, and merged its lower edge with, the horizon. While still higher, shone a mackerel sky, and mare's tail clouds, sure index of coming wind. But there was nothing on the horizon in the way of sail or smoke, and, anticipating another long night watch, he began preparations for it. Three red lights at the masthead were needed as a signal that the boat, a steamer, was not under command. These he found in the lamp room. He filled, trimmed, and rigged them to the signal halyards on the bridge, ready for hoisting at nightfall. Then, for a day signal of distress, he hoisted an ensign, Union Down, at the small yard aloft. Next in his mind came the wish to know his position, and he examined the logbook. Forsyth had made an attempt to start a record, and out of his crude efforts, Devin picked the figures which he had noted down as the latitude and longitude at noon of the day before. He corrected this with the boat's course throughout the afternoon, until the time of shutting off the oil feed, and added the influence of a current, which his more expert knowledge told him of. 31 north and 55, 40 west was the approximate position, and he jotted it down. This done, he thought of the possibility of lighting the boat through the night, and sought the engine room. He was but a theoretical engineer, having devoted most of his studies to the duties of a line officer. But he mastered in a short time the management of the small gas engine that worked a dynamo, and soon had it going. Electric bulbs in the engine room sprang into life. And, after watching the engine for a short time, he decided that it required only occasional inspection, and sought the deck. The cross sea was increasing, and the bank to the northwest was larger and blacker, while the mare's tails and mackerel scales had given way to cirrus clouds that raced across the sky. Damp gusts of wind blew cold and heavy against his cheek, and he knew that a storm was coming that would try out the low-built craft to the last of its powers. But before it came, he would polish up his forgotten knowledge of wireless telegraphy and search the wireless room for books. He found everything but what he wanted most, the code book, by which he could furbish up dots and dashes. Angry at his bad memory, he studied the apparatus, found it in working order, and left the task to go on deck. An increased rolling of the boat threatened the open deadlights. Trusting that the men in the forecastle would close theirs, he attended to all the others, then sought Flory in the galley, where she had just finished the washing of the dishes. Her face was not pale, but there was a wild look in her eyes, and she was somewhat unsteady on her feet. Oh, Billy, I'm sick, seasick, she said weakly. I'm a poor sailor. Go to bed, little girl, he said gently. We're going to have some bad weather, but we're all right, so stay in bed. He supported her aft through the wardroom to her stateroom door in the after cabin. 
I'll get supper, Flory. And if you can eat, I'll bring you some. Lie down now, and don't get up until I call you, or until you feel better. He again sought the deck. The wind now came steadily, while the whole sky above and the sea about were assuming the gray hue of a gale. He closed all hatches and companions, taking a peep down into the engine room before closing it up. The dynamo was buzzing finally. A few splashes of rain fell on him, and he clothed himself in oilskins and rubber boots to watch out the gale, choosing to remain aft, where his footsteps over her might reassure the seasick girl below, instead of the bridge, where he would have placed himself under normal conditions. The afternoon wore on, each hour marked by a heavier pressure of the wind and an increasing height to the seas, which, at first just lapping at the rail, now lifted up and washed across the deck. The boat rolled somewhat, but not to add to his discomfort, or that of those below, but there were no loose articles on deck to be washed overboard. So Denman paced the deck, occasionally peeping down the engine room hatch at the dynamo, and again trying the drift by the old-fashioned chip-and-reel log at the stern. When tired, he would sit down in the deck chair, which he had wedged between the after torpedo and the taffrail, then resume his pacing. As darkness closed down, he sought Flory's door and asked her if she would eat something. She was too ill, she said, and knowing that no words could comfort her, he left her and in the galley ate his own supper. Tinned meat, bread, and coffee. Again the deck, the intermittent pacing, and resting in the chair. The gale became a hurricane in the occasional squalls, but at these times, the sea were beaten to a level of creamy froth, luminous with a phosphorescent glow, while the boat's rolling motion would give way to a stiff inclination to starboard of fully ten degrees. Then the squalls would pass, the seas rise the higher for the momentary suppression, and the boat resumed her wallowing, rolling both rails under and practically underwater except for the high forecastle deck, the funnels, and the companions. Denman did not worry. With the wind northwest, the storm center was surely to the north and eastward of him. And he knew that, according to the laws of storms in the North Atlantic, it would move away from him and out to sea. And so it continued until about midnight, when he heard the rasping of the companion hood then saw Flory's face peering out. He sprang to the companion. Billy! Oh, Billy! She said plaintively. Let me come up here with you. But you'll feel better lying down, dear, he said. Better go back. It's so close and hot down here. Please let me come up. Why, yes, Flory, if you like. I'll wait until I fit you out. Come down a moment. They descended, and he found rubber boots, a sou'wester, and a long oilskin coat, which she donned in her room. Then he brought up another chair, lashed it with more neckties to his own, and seated her in it. Don't be frightened, he said, as a sea climbed on board and washed aft, nearly flooding the rubber boots and listening a little scream from the girl. We're safe, and the wind will blow out in a few hours. He seated himself beside her. As they faced the leeward, the long brims of the sou'westers sheltered their faces from a blast of rain and spume, permitting conversation. But they did not converse for a time. Denman only reached up inside a long sleeve of her big coat to where her small hand nestled, soft and warm, in its shelter. He squeezed it gently, but there was no answering pressure, and he contented himself with holding it. 
he was a good sailor, but a poor lover. And a reeling water-washed deck in a gale of wind is an embarrassing obstacle to lovemaking. Yet he squeezed again, after ten minutes of silence had gone by, and several seas had bombarded their feet. Still no response in kind, and he spoke. Flory, he said, as gently as he could when he was compelled to shout. Do you remember the letter you sent me the other day? The other day, she answered. Why, it seems like years since then. Last week, Flory, it made me feel like, like thirty cents. Why, Billy? Oh, the unwritten roast between the lines, little girl. I knew what you thought of me. I knew that I'd never made good. How? What do you mean? About the fight. Years ago. I was to come back and lick him, you know. And didn't. That's all. Are you still thinking of that, Billy? Why, you've won. You're an officer. While he is a sailor. Yes. But he licked me at school. And I know you expected me to come back. And you did not come back. You never let me hear from you. You might have been dead for years before I could know it. Is that it, Flory? He exclaimed in amazement. Was it me you thought of? I supposed you had grown to despise me. She did not answer this. But when he again pressed her hand, she responded. Then, over the sounds of the storm, he heard a little sob, and, reaching over, drew her face close to his and kissed her. I'm sorry, Flory, but I didn't know. I've loved you all these years, but I did not know it until a few days ago. And I'll never forget it, Flory, and I promise you, and myself too, that I'll still make good as I promised before. Poor lover though he was, he had won. She did not answer, but her own small hand reached for his. And so they passed the night, until, just as a lighter gray shone in the east, he noticed the one of the red lamps at the signal yard had gone out. As the lights were still necessary, he went forward to lower them. But just as he was about to mount the bridge stairs, a crashing blow from two heavy fists sent him headlong and senseless to the deck. When he came to, he was bound hand and foot as he had bound the men, with neckerchiefs, and lay close to the forward funnel, with the whole thirteen, Jenkins and all, looking down at him. But Jenkins was not speaking. Forsyth, searching Demon's pockets, was doing all that the occasion required. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 17. When Samson had entered the forecastle after his rescue by Denman, he found a few of his mates in their bunks, the rest sitting around in disconsolate postures, some holding their aching heads, others looking indifferently at him with bleary eyes. The apartment, long and triangular in shape, was dimly lighted by four deadlights, two each side, and for a moment Samson could not distinguish one from another. Where's my bag? He demanded generally. I want dry clothes. He groped his way to the bunk he had occupied, found his clothes bag, and drew out a complete change of garments. Who's got a knife? was his next request. And, as no one answered, he repeated the demand in a louder voice. 
What do you want of a knife? asked Forsyth, with a slight snarl. To cut your throat, you hangdog scoundrel, said Samson irately. Forsyth, you speak kindly and gently to me while we're together, or I'll break some of you small bones. Who's got a knife? Here's one, Samson, said Hawks, offering one of the square-bladed jackknives used in the Navy. All right, Hawks. Now you stand up and rip these wet duds off me. I can't get them off with the darbies in the way. Hawk stood up and obeyed him. Soon the dripping garments fell away, and Samson rubbed himself dry with a towel, while Hawks sleepily turned in. What kept you? And what happened? asked Kelly. Did he douse you with a bucket of water? Samson did not answer at once, not until he had slashed the side seams of a whole new suit and crawled into it. Then, as he began fastening it on with buttons and strings, he said coldly, Worse than that, he's made me his friend. His friend? queried two or three. His friend, repeated Samson. Not exactly while he has me locked up he added. But if I ever get out again, that's all. And his friend in some ways while I'm here. Do you hear that, Forsyth? Forsyth did not answer, and Samson went on. And not only his friend, but the woman's too. Hear that, Forsyth? Forsyth refused to answer. That's right and proper went on Samson, as he fastened the last button. Hide your head and saw wood, you snake-eyed imitation of a man. What's up, Samson? wearily asked Casey from a bunk. What doused you? And what you got on Forsyth now? I'll tell you in good time, responded Samson. I'll tell you now about Denman. I threw all the booze overboard at his orders. Then I tumbled over. And, as I can't swim, would have been there yet if he hadn't jumped after me. Then we couldn't get up the side, and the woman came with a tablecloth. That held me until I was towed to the anchor ladder. That's all. I just want to hear one of you ginks say a word about the woman that she wouldn't like to hear. That's for you all. And for you, Forsyth, a little more in good time. Bully for the woman, growled old Kelly. Wonder if we treated her right. We treated her as well as we knew how, said Samson. That is, all but one of us. But I've promised Denman, and the woman through him, that they'll have a better show if we get charge again. Ah, oh, forget it, grunted Forsyth from his bunk. She's no good. She's been stuck on that baby since she was a kid. Samson went toward him, seized him by the shirt collar, and pulled him bodily from the bunk. Then, smothering his protesting voice by a grip in his throat, slatted him from side to side, as a farmer uses a flail, and threw him headlong against the after bulkhead and halfway into an empty bunk. Samson had uttered no word, and Forsyth only muttered as he crawled back to his own bunk. But he found courage to say, What do you pick on me for? If you hadn't all got drunk, you wouldn't be here. You mean, said Samson quietly, that if you hadn't remained sober enough to find your way into the after cabin and frighten the woman, we wouldn't have been here, for that's what roused Denman. A few oaths and growls followed this, and men sat up in their bunks, while those that were out of their bunks stood up. Samson sat down. Is that so, Samson? Got that right, old man? Sure of it? They asked. And then, over the hubbub of profane indignation, 
Rose Forsythe's voice. Who gave you that? He yelled. Denman? Yes, Denman, answered Samson. He lied. I did nothing of a... You lie yourself, you dog. You're showing on your chin the marks of Denman's fist. You did that just now, answered Forsythe, fingering a small bleeding bruise. I didn't hit you. I choked you. Denman knocked you out. Well, answered Forsythe, forgetting the first accusation in light of his last. It was a lucky blow in the dark. He couldn't do it in the daylight. Self-convicted, said Samson quietly. Then, for a matter of ten minutes, the air in a close apartment might have smelled sulfurous to one strange to forecastle discourse. Forsythe, his back toward them, listened quietly while they called him all the names, printable and unprintable, which angry and disgusted men may think of. But when it had ended, when the last voice had silenced and the last man gone to the water faucet for a drink before turning in, Forsythe said, I'll even things up with you fellows if I get on deck again. Only a few grunts answered him, and soon all were asleep. They waken, one by one, in the afternoon, to find the electric bulbs glowing and the boat rolling heavily, while splashes of rain came in through the weather deadlights. These they closed, and, better humored after their sleep, and hungry as well, they attacked the barrel of bread and the water faucet. He started the dynamo, remarked Riley, one of the engineers. Why don't he start the engine and keep her head to the sea? Because he knows too much, came a hoarse whisper, and he turned to Jenkins, who was sitting up, regarding them disapprovingly. Because he knows too much, he repeated in the same hoarse whisper. This is a so-called seagoing destroyer, but no one but a fool would buck one into a head sea. And that's what's coming, with a big blow, too. Remember the English boat that broke her back in the North Sea? Hello, Jenkins. You alive? Answered one, and others asked of his health. I'm pretty near all right, he said to them. I've been able to move and speak a little for 24 hours, but I saved my energy. I wasn't sure of myself, though, or I'd have nabbed Denman when he came in here for the pistols. Has he got them? queried a few, and they examined the empty bunk. He sure has, they continued. Got them all. Ah, oh, we're in for it. Not necessarily, said Jenkins. I've listened to all this powwow, and I gather that you got drunk to the last man, and he gathered you in. That's about it, Jenkins, assented Samson. We all got gloriously drunk. And before you got drunk, you made this pinheaded, educated rat, he jerked his thumb towards Forsyth, your commander. Well, we needed a navigator, and you were out of commission, Jenkins. I'm in commission now, though, and when we get on deck, we'll still have a navigator, and it won't be Denman either. What do you mean? began Forsyth. That you'll take charge again and make... Yes, said Jenkins. Make you navigate. Make you navigate under orders and under fear of punishment. You're the worst hammered man in this crowd, but hammering doesn't improve you. You'll be keel-hauled, or triced up by the thumbs, or spread eagle over a boiler. But you'll navigate. Now shut up. There was silence for a while. Then one said, You spoke about getting on deck again, Jenkins. Got any plan? Want to go on deck now and watch in this storm? Jenkins retorted. No, 
not unless necessary. And get in your bunk and wait for this to blow over. If there's any real need of us, Denman will call us out. This was good cellular logic, and they climbed back into their bunks to smoke, to read, or to talk themselves to sleep again. As the wind and sea arose, they closed the other two deadlights. And when darkness closed down, they turned out all the dazzling bulbs and slept through the night, as only sailors can. Just before daylight, Jenkins lifted his big bulk out of the bunk, and, taking a key from his pocket, unlocked the forecastle door. He stepped into the passage and found the hatch loose on the combings, then came back and quietly wakened them all. I found this key on the deck near the door first day aboard, he volunteered, but put it in my pocket instead of the door. They softly crept into the passage and lifted the hatch, but it was the impressible and most certainly courageous Forsyth who was the first to climb up. He reached the deck just in time to dodge into the darkness behind the bridge ladder at the sight of Denman coming forward to attend to the lamps. And it was he who sent both fists into the side of Denman's face, with force enough to knock him senseless. Then came the others. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Pirates by Mort Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 18 That'll do, Forsyth, said Samson, interrupting the flow of Billingsgate. We'll omit prayers and flowers at this funeral. Stand up. Forsyth arose, waving two bunches of keys and Devin's revolver. Got him foul, he yelled excitedly. All the keys and his gun. All right, just hand that gun to me. What? You won't. Forsyth had backed away at the command, but Samson sprang upon him and easily disarmed him. Now, my lad, he said sternly. Just find the key of these darbies and unlock us. Forsyth, muttering, got one good smash in him anyhow, found the key of the handcuffs, and, first unlocking his own, went the rounds. Then he found the key of the leg irons, and soon they were all free, and the manacles tossed down the hatch to be gathered up later. Then, Big Jenkins reached his hand out to Forsyth, but not in a token of amnesty. The keys, he said in a hoarse whisper. Aren't they safe enough with me? queried Forsyth hotly. Jenkins still maintained the outstretched hand, and Forsyth looked irresolutely around. He saw no signs of sympathy. They were all closing in on him and he meekly handed the two bunches to Jenkins, who pocketed them. Meanwhile, Samson had lifted Denman to his feet, and, as the boat still rolled heavily, he assisted him to the bridge stairs, where he could get a grip on the railing with his fettered hands. Daylight had come, and Denman could see Flory, still seated in the deck chair, looking forward with frightened eyes. Jenkins, step here a moment, said Samson. And you other fellows, keep back. Jenkins drew near. Did you hear in the forecastle, Samson went on, what I said about Mr. Denman saving my life, and that I promised him parole and the possession of his gun in case we got charged again? Jenkins nodded, but said, He broke his parole before. So would you, under the same provocation. Forsyth called him a milk-fed thief. Wouldn't you have struck out? Jenkins nodded again, and Samson continued. 
All right. My proposition is to place Mr. Denman under parole once more, to give him and a lady the run of the deck abaft the galley hatch, and to leave them both the possession of their guns for self-defense, in case... He looked humorously around at the others. These inebriates get drunk again. But the other guns, he has them somewhere. We want power of self-defense, too. Mr. Denman, said Samson, turning to the prisoner. You've heard the conditions. Will you tell us where the arms are? And will you keep after the galley hatch, you and the lady? I will, answered Denman, on condition that you all, and particularly your navigator, keep forward to the galley hatch. We'll do that, sir, except, of course, in case of working or fighting ship. Now, tell us where the guns are, and we'll release you. Haven't we something to say about this? inquired Forsyth, while a few others grumbled at disapproval of the plan. No, you have not, answered Jenkins, his hoarse whisper becoming a voice. Not a one of you. Samson and I will be responsible for this. All right, then, responded Forsyth. But I'll carry my gun all the time. I'm not going to be shot down without a white man's chance. You'll carry a gun, my son, said Samson, when we give it to you. And then it won't be to shoot Mr. Denman. It's on your account, remember, that we're giving him a gun. Now, Mr. Denman, where are the pistols and toothpicks? The pistols are in my room. The cutlass is in the room opposite. You have the keys. Aft all hands, ordered Jenkins, fumbling in his pockets for the keys. And get the weapons. Away they trooped and crowded down the wardroom companion. Samson lifting his cap politely to the girl in the chair. In a short time they reappeared, each man loaded down with pistols and cutlasses. They placed them in the forecastle, and when they had come up, Samson released Denman's bonds. Now, sir, you are free. We'll keep our promises, and we expect you to keep yours. Here's your gun, Mr. Denman. Thank you, Samson, said Denman, pocketing the revolver and shaking his aching hands to circulate the blood. Of course, we are to keep our promises. Even though you see things done that will raise your hair, sir. What do you mean by that? asked Denman with sudden interest. Can't tell you anything, sir, except what you may know or will know. This boat is not bound for the African coast. That's all, sir. Go below the watch, broke in Jenkins' husky voice. To stations, the rest. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 19 What happened, Billy? asked Flory as Denman joined her. Not much, Flory, he replied, as cheerfully as was possible in his mood. Only a physical and practical demonstration that I am the two ends and the bite of a fool. You're not a fool, Billy. But what happened? How did they get out? By picking the lock of the door, I suppose. Or, perhaps, they had a key inside. That's where the fool comes in. I should have nailed the door on them. And what do they mean to do? Don't know. They have some new project in mind. But we're better off than before, girl. 
are at liberty to carry arms and to go and come, provided we stay this side of the galley hatch. There, let us alone and stay forward of the hatch. By the way, he added, in view of the rather indeterminate outlook, let's carry our hardware outside. He removed his belt from his waist and buckled it outside his oilskin coat. Then, when he transferred the pistol from his pocket to the scabbard, he assisted the girl. There, he said, as he stood back and looked at her admiringly. With all due regard for your good looks, Flory, you resemble a cross between a cowboy and a second mate. No more so than you, she retorted. But I've lost my place as cook, I think. She pointed at the galley chimney from which smoke was arising. Denman looked, and also became interested in an excited convention forward. Though Jenkins had sent the watch below and the rest to stations, only the two cooks had obeyed. The others, with the boat still rolling in the heavy sea, had surrounded Jenkins and seemed to be arguing with him. The big man, saving his voice, answered only by signs as yet but the voices of the others soon became audible to the two aft. I tell you, it all worked out, Jenkins. All figured out while you were dopey in your bunk. Jenkins shook his head. Then followed an exciting burst of reason and flow of words from which Denman could only gather a few disjointed phrases. Dead easy, Jenkins. Run close in the land. Casey's brother. Can hoof it, too. Might get a job, which be better. Got a private code made up. Don't need money. Can't beat his way in. My brother has a wireless. Take the dinghy. We don't need it. I'll take the chance if you have a life buoy handy. Chance of a lifetime. Who wants beachcombing in Africa? You'll see. You'll watch the financial news. I'll stow away in her. I'll tell you, Jenkins, there'll be no killing. I've made up my mind to that, and we'll see to it. The last speech was from Samson. And, on hearing it, Jenkins waved them all away. Then he used his voice. Get to stations, he said. I'll think it out. Forsyth, take the bridge and dope out where we are. They scattered, and Forsyth mounted to the bridge, while Jenkins, still a sick man, descended to the forecastle. What does it all mean, Billy? asked the girl. Having the slightest idea, answered Denman as he seated himself beside her. They've all been hinting at big things, and Samson said that they might raise my hair. However, we'll know soon. The wind is going down. This was the outer fringe of a cyclone. Why don't they go ahead? Too much sea. These boats are made for speed, not strength. You can break their backs by steaming into a head sea. Daniels, the cook, came on deck and aft to the limits of the hatch, indicating by his face and manner that he wished to speak to Denman. Denman arose and approached him. Will you and the lady eat breakfast together, sir? he asked. I believe so, answered Denman. Then, turning to Flory, how will it be? May I eat breakfast with you this morning? She nodded. Then, sir, said Daniels, I'll have to serve it in the after cabin. Why not the wardroom? Why not keep out of Miss Fleming's apartment? Because, Mr. Denman, our work is laid out. Billings attends to the wardroom and swears he won't serve this lady or get within reach of her. Serve it in the after cabin, then, said Denman. 
turning away to hide the coming smile. And Daniel's departed. Not caring to agitate the girl with the account of Billings' drunken overtures and his own vicarious repulse of them, he did not explain to her Billings' trouble of mind. But he found trouble of his own in explaining his frequent bursts of laughter when they ate their breakfast in the cabin. And Flory found trouble in accepting his explanations, for they were irrelevant, incompetent, and inane. After breakfast, they went on deck without oilskins, for wind and sea were going down. There was a dry deck, and above, a sky which, still gray with the background of storm cloud, yet showed an occasional glimmer of blue, while to the east, the sun shone clear and unobstructed, but on the whole clean-cut horizon, there was not a sign of sail or smoke. Eight bells having struck, the watches were changed, but except possibly a man in the engine room getting up steam, for smoke was pouring out of the four funnels. No one was at stations. The watch on deck was scattered about forward, and Forsyth had given way to Jenkins, who, with his eye fixed to a long telescope, was scanning the horizon from the bridge. Denman, for over 48 hours without sleep, could have turned in had not curiosity kept him awake. So he waited until 9 o'clock, when Forsyth, with Munson's help, took morning sights, and later until 10, when Forsyth handed Jenkins a slip of paper on which presumably he had jotted the boat's approximate position. Immediately, Jenkins ran the engine bells, and the boat forged ahead. Denman watched her swing to a starboard wheel, and, when the rolling gave way to a pitching motion as she met the head sea, he glanced at the after binnacle compass. Northwest by north, half north, he said. Whatever their plan is, Jenkins had been won over. Flory, better turn in. I'm going to. Lock your door and keep that gun handy. But they were not menaced, not even roused for dinner, for Daniels had gone below, and Billings, on watch for the morning, could not wake Deadman, and would not approach Miss Flory's door. So it was late in the afternoon when they again appeared on deck. The weather had cleared, the sea was smoothing, and the boat surging along under the cruising turbines, while Hawks had the wheel, and Forsyth, still in officer's uniform, paced back and forth. Evidently, Jenkins, in light of his physical and mental limitations, had seen the need of an assistant. Old Kelly, the gunner's mate, was fussing around a 12-pounder. The rest were out of sight. Denman concluded that some kind of sea discipline had been established while he slept and that Kelly had been put in charge of the gunnery department and been relieved from standing watch. Otherwise, by the former arrangement, Kelly would have been below while Forsyth and Hawks were on deck. The horizon was dotted with specks, some showing smoke, others, under the glass, showing canvas. Demon examined each by the captain's binoculars, but saw no signs of a government craft. All were peaceably going their way. Why is it, asked Flory, as she took the glass from Denman, that we see so many vessels now, when we lay for days without seeing any? We were in a pocket, I suppose, answered Denman. Lane routes, trade routes, for high and low-powered craft, as well as for sailing craft, are so well established these days that... If you get between them, you can wait for weeks without seeing anything. Do you think there's any chance of our being rescued soon? I don't know, Flory. Though we can't go much nearer the coast without being recognized. In fact, I haven't thought about it much lately. The truth is, 
I'm getting interested in these fellows. This is the most daring and desperate game I ever saw played, and how they'll come out is a puzzle. Hello, eight bells. The bell was struck on the bridge, and the watches changed, except that Jenkins, after a short talk with Forsyth, did not relieve him, but came aft to the engine room hatch, where he held another short talk with Samson and Riley, who, instead of going below, had waited. Only a few words came to Denman's ears, and these in the hoarse accents of Jenkins as he left them. Six days at cruising speed, you say, and two at full steam? All right. Jenkins continued aft, but halted and called the retreating Samson, who joined him. Then the two approached the galley hatch and hailed Denman. Captain Jenkins can't talk very well, sir, said Samson, with a conciliatory grin. But he wants me to ask you what you did to him. He says he bears no grudge. Can't tell you, answered Denman promptly. It is a trick of Japanese jiu-jitsu, not taught in the schools, and known only to experts. I learned it in Japan when my life was in danger. Jenkins nodded, as though satisfied with the explanation and Samson resumed. Another thing we came aft for, Mr. Denman, is to notify you that we must search the skipper's room in the wardroom for whatever money there is on board. There may be none, but we want the last cent. What on earth, exclaimed Denman, do you want with money? Then, as their faces clouded, he said, I'll go ahead. Don't turn my room upside down. You'll find my pile and a suit of citizen's clothes hanging up. About four and a half. Four and a half is a whole lot, sir, remarked Samson as he descended the wardrobe match. Got any money down below, Flory? inquired Denman, joining the girl. She shook her head. No, I lost everything but what I wear. The tears that started to her eyes apprised Denman that hers was more than a money loss. But there was no comfort of mere words for such loss, and he went on quickly. They are going through the cabin for money. They'll get all I've got. Did you see any cash in the captain's desk? Why, yes, Billy, she said hesitatingly. I wanted a place to put my combs when I wore the bandage, and I saw some money in the upper desk. It was a roll. He's lost it, then. Always was a careless man. Did you count it? No. I had no right to. But the question in Denman's mind was answered by Samson when he and Jenkins emerged from the hatch. Five hundred, he said. Fine. We won't need a quarter of it, Jenkins. Five hundred, repeated Demon to the girl. Jailbreaking? Stealing government property? Mutiny? Against me? Piracy? And burglary? Heaven help them when they are caught. But will they be? Can't help but be caught. I know nothing of their plans, but I do know that they're running right into the hornet's nest. If a single one of those crafts on the horizon recognizes this boat and can wireless the nearest station, we'll be surrounded tomorrow. But, as it happened, they were not recognized, though they took desperate chances in charging through a coasting fleet in daylight. And at nightfall, Jenkins gave the order for full speed. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Pirates by Lord Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 20 For an hour, Demna remained with Flory to witness the unusual spectacle of a 40 knot destroyer in a hurry. 
The wind was practically gone, though a heavy groundswell still met the boat from the northwest. And as there was no moon, nor starlight, and as all lights were out but the white masthead and the red and green side lights, invisible from aft, but dimly lighting the sea ahead, the sight presented was unusual and awe-inspiring. They seemed to be looking at an ever-receding wall of solid blackness, beneath which rose and spread from the high bow to starward in port, two huge moving snowdrifts, lessening in size as the bow lifted over the crest of a sea that climbed, and increasing to a liquid avalanche of foam that sent spaggles up the bright illumination of the masthead light when the prow buried itself in the base of the next sea. Astern was a white, self-luminous wake that narrowed to a point in the distance before it had lost its phosphorescent glow. Flory was interested only in the glorious picture as a whole. Denman, equally impressed, was interested in the somewhat rare spectacle of a craft meeting at forty knots, a sea running at twenty, for not a drop of water hit the deck where they stood. They went below at last, but Denman, having slept nearly all day, was long in getting to sleep. A curious, futile, an inconsequential thought bothered him. The thought that the cheerful buildings had ceased his singing in the galley. The monotonous humming of the turbines brought sleep at last. But he awakened at daylight from a dream in which Billings, dressed in a mother hubbard and a poke bonnet, was trying to force a piece of seawater soap into his mouth, and had almost succeeded when he awoke. But it was the stopping of the turbines that really had awakened him and he dressed hurriedly and went on deck. There was nothing amiss. No one was in sight but Jenkins, who leaned lazily against the bridge rail. In the dim light that shone, nothing could be seen on the horizon or within it. So, a little ashamed of his uncalled-for curiosity, he hurried down and turned in, all standing, to wait for breakfast and an explanation. But no explanation was given him, either by events or the attitude of the men. Those on deck avoided the after end of the boat, all except old Kelly, whose duties brought him finally to the after guns and tubes. But, while civilly lifting his cap to Miss Flory, he was grouchy and taciturn in his manner until his work was done. Then he halted at the galley hatch on his way forward to lean over and pronounce anathema of the heads of the cooks because of the quality of the food. While waiting for breakfast, Denman had listened to an angry and wordy argument between the two cooks, in which Daniels had voiced his opinion of Billings for waking him from his watch below to serve the prisoners. When the watches were changed at eight bells that morning, he had heard Hawks and Davis the two seamen of the deck department, protesting violently to Jenkins at the promotion of Forsyth and Kelly, which left them to do all the steering. Jenkins had not answered orally, but his gestures overruled the protest. Even Casey and Munson argued almost to quarreling over various tricks of their trade, which Denman, as he listened, could only surmise were to form a part of the private code they had spoken of when haranguing Jenkins. There was a nervous unrest pervading them all, which, while leaving Flory and Devin intact, even reached the engine room. At noon, Samson and Dwyer were relieved, and the former turned back to shout down the hatch, I told you to do it, and that goes. We've overhauled and cleaned it. You two, assemble and oil it up this afternoon, or you'll hear from me at eight bells. The voice of Riley, who was nearly as large a man as Samson, answered hotly but inarticulately, and Denman can only ascribe the row to a difference of opinion concerning the condition of some parts of the engines. Samson, though possibly a lesser engineer than the others of his department, yet dominated them as Jenkins dominated them all, by pure force of personality. He had made himself chief engineer, and his orders were obeyed 
as evidenced by the tranquil silence that emanated from the engine room when Samson returned at four in the afternoon. All day the boat lay with quiet engines and a bare head of steam, rolling slightly in a swell that came from the east, while the sun shone brightly overhead from east to west, and only a few specks appeared on the horizon to remain for a time, then vanish. Meanwhile, Flory worried Denman with questions he could not answer. Forsyth took the sights in the morning, he explained at length, and a meridian observation at noon. He has undoubtedly found another pocket, as I call these triangular spaces between the routes. But I do not know where we are. Except that, computing our yesterday and last night's run, we are within from 60 to 100 miles of New York. He was further mystified when, on going to his room for a cigar after supper, he found his suit of citizen's clothes missing from its hook. Not the same thief, he grumbled. Samson and Jenkins are too big for it. He did not mention his loss to Flory, not wishing to arouse further feminine speculation. And when, at a later hour, in this higher latitude, darkness had come, and full speed was rung to the engine room, he induced her to retire. I don't know what's up, he said, but get all the sleep you can. I'll call you if anything happens. He did not go to sleep himself, but smoked and waited while the humming turbines gathered in the miles. One hour, two hours, nearly three, until a quarter to eleven o'clock, when speed was reduced. Remembering his embarrassment of the morning, the dead man did not seek the deck, but looked through his deadlight. Nothing but darkness met his eye. It was a black night with rain. He entered the lighted wardroom and looked at the telltale above. It told him that the boat was heading due north. Then he entered an opposite room. All were unlocked now, from which, slanting through the deadlight, he saw lights. He threw open the thick, round window and saw more clearly. Lights. Shore lights. A head and to port. He saw no land, but from the perspective of the lights, he judged that they ran east and west. Then he heard the call of the lead. A quarter seventeen. And a little later, by the deep seventeen, delivered in the sing-song voice by Hawks. The coast of Long Island, muttered Demon. Well, for picked up schoolboy navigation, it is certainly a feat to run over 600 miles and stop over soundings. The boat went on at reduced speed until Hawks had called out, By the Mark 10! When the engines stopped, and there was a rush of footsteps on deck that centered over the open deadlight, above which was slung to the davits the boat called by then the dinghy, but which was only a very small gasoline launch. In with you, Casey, said Jenkins in a low, hoarse voice, and turn her over. See about the bottom plug, too. Clear away those guys fore and aft, you fellows. In a few moments came the buzzing of a small engine. Then it stopped, and Casey said, Engine's all right, and so is the plug. Shove out and lower away. Got everything right, Casey? Got your money? Got the code? Got everything, was the impatient answer. Well, remember, you're to head the boat out from the beach, pull the bottom plug, and let her sink in deep water. Make sure your wheels and midships. Shove out and lower away, retorted Casey. Do you think I never learned to run a NAFTA launch? 
Denman heard the creaking sound of the davits turning in their beds. Then the slackening away of the falls, their unhooking by Casey, and the chugging of the engine as the launch drew away. Good luck, Casey, called Jenkins. All right, answered Casey from the distance. Have your life buoys handy. Denman ducked out of sight as the launch was lowered, and he did not see Casey. But, on opening a locker in his room for a fresh box of cigars, he noticed that his laundry had been tampered with. Six shirts and twice as many collars were gone. On looking further, he missed the new derby hat that he had prized more than usual. Also his suitcase. Casey and I are about the same size, he muttered. But what the deuce does it all mean? He went to sleep with the turbines humming full speed in his ears. But he wakened when they were reduced to cruising speed. Looking at his watch in the light from the wardroom, he found that it was half past two. And, on stepping out for a look at the telltale, he found the boat heading due south. Back in the pocket, he said, as he returned to his room. But the engines did not stop, as he partly expected, but remained at half speed, and the boat still headed south when he wakened at breakfast time. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Pirates by Morton Robertson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 21 After breakfast, King, one of the machinists, and a pleasant-faced young man, came aft with an ensign, a hammer, chisel, and paint pot. This is work, sir, he said as he passed tipping his cap politely to Miss Flory. Should have been done before. He went to the taffrail, and, leaning over with a hammer and chisel, removed the raised letters that spelled the boat's name. Then he covered the hiatus with paint and hoisted the ensign to the flagstaff. Now, sir, he remarked, as he gathered up his tools and paint pot, she's a government craft again. I see, commented Denman. Then to Flory, as King went forward. They're getting foxy. We're steaming into the crowd again, and they want to forestall inspection and suspicion. I wonder if our being allowed on deck is part of the plan. A lady and an officer aft look legitimate. At noon, every man was dressed to the regulations in clean blue with neckerchief and knife lanyard, while Jenkins and Forsyth appeared in full undress uniform, with tasteful linen and neckwear. That this was part of the plan was proven when, after a display of bunting in the international signal code from the yard up forward, they ranged alongside of an outboard tank steamer that had kindly slowed down for them. All hands, but one cook and one engineer, had mustered on deck, showing a fair semblance of a full-powered watch. And the one cook, Billings, displayed himself above the hatch for one brief moment, clad in spotless white jacket. Then, just before the two bridges came together, Jenkins hurried down the steps and aft Denman to speak a few words, then hastened forward. It was sufficiently theatrical to impress the skipper of the tanker, but what Jenkins really said to them in was, You are to remember your parole, sir, and not hail that steamer. To which Denman had nodded assent. Steamer ahoy! shouted Forsyth through a small megaphone. You are laden with oil, as you said by signal. We would like to replenish our supply, which is almost exhausted. Yes, sir answered the skipper. But to whom shall I send the bill? To the superintendent of the Charleston Navy Yard. 
will very likely be paid to your owners before you get back. We want as much as a hundred tons. I have made out a receipt for that amount. Throw us a heaving line to take our hose, and I will send it up on the bite. Very well, sir. Anything else I can do for you, sir? Yes. We want about 200 gallons of water. Been out a long time. Certainly, sir. Very glad to accommodate you. Then after that runaway torpedo boat? Yes. Any news of her on shore? Our wireless is out of order. Well, the opinion is that she was lost in a big blow a few days ago. She was reported well to the north, and it was a St. Lawrence Valley storm. Did you get any of it? Very little, answered Forsyth. We were well to the southern. A slight stumble in good diction there, Mr. Forsyth, muttered the listening Denman. Otherwise, very well carried out. But the deluded tankskeeper made no strictures on Forsyth's diction. And, while the pleasant conversation was going on, the two lines of hose were passed, and the receipt for oil and water sent up to the steamer. In a short time, the tanks were filled, the hose hauled back, and the starting bells run in both engine rooms. The destroyer was first to gather way, and, as her stern drew abreast of the tanker's bridge, the skipper lifted his cap to Florian Denman and called out, Good afternoon, Captain. I'm very glad that I was able to accommodate you. To which Denman, with all hands looking expectantly at him, only replied with a bow, as became a dignified commander with two well-trained officers on his bridge to attend to the work. The boat circled around, headed northwest, and went on at full speed until not only the tanker, but every other craft in view had sunk beneath the horizon. Then the engines were stopped and the signal yard sent down. Back in the pocket again, said Denman to Flory. What on earth can they be driving at? And why? She answered with another query. Did they go to all that trouble to be so polite and nice? When, as you say, they are fully committed to piracy and rob the other vessels by force. This seems to show, he said, the master hand of Jenkins, who was a natural-born gentleman, as against the work of Forsyth, who was a natural-born brute. Yet he is a high school graduate, and Jenkins is a past seaman apprentice. What is that? One who enters the Navy at about 15 or 16 to serve until he is 21 then to leave the Navy or re-enlist. They seldom re-enlist, for they are trained, tutored, and disciplined into good workmen, to whom shore life offers better opportunities. Those who do re-enlist have raised the standard of the Navy sailor to the highest in the world, but those that don't are sad loss to the Navy. Jenkins re-enlisted. So did Forsyth. But do you think the training and tutoring that Jenkins received equal to an education like Forsyth's or yours? They learn more facts, answered Denman. The training makes a man of a bad boy and a gentleman of a good one. What a ghastly pity that, because of conservatism and politics, all this splendid material for officers should go to waste and the appointments to Annapolis be given to good, high school scholars, who might be cowardly sissies at heart, or blackguards like Forsyth. But that is how you received your appointment, Billy Denman, said the girl warmly. And you are neither a sissy nor a blackguard. I hope not, he answered grimly. Yet, if I had first served my time as seaman apprentice before being appointed to Annapolis, I might be up on that bridge now, instead of standing supinely while one seaman apprentice does the navigating, and another 
the bossing. There is that man again. I'm afraid of him, Billy. All the others, except Forsyth, have been civil to me. But he looks at me so, so hatefully. Billings, minus his clean white jacket, had come up the hatch and gone forward. He came back soon, showing a sullen, scowling face, as though his cheerful disposition had entirely left him. As he reached the galley hatch, he cast upon the girl a look of such intense hatred and malevolence that Denman, white with anger, sprang to the hatch and halted him. If ever again, he said explosively, I catch you glaring at this lady in that manner, parole or no parole, I'll throw you overboard. Billing's face straightened. He saluted and, without a word, went down the hatch while Denman returned to the girl. He's an enlisted man, he said bitterly, not a past seaman apprentice, so I down him easily with a few words. And then came the thought, which he did not express to Flory, that his fancied limitations, which prevented him from being on the bridge, also prevented him from enlightening the moored billings as to the real source of the terrible punch he had received. For, while he could justify his silence to Flory, he could only, with regard to Billings, feel a masculine dread of ridicule at dressing in feminine clothing. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter 22 At supper that evening, they were served with prunes, bread without butter, and weak tea, with neither milk nor sugar. Orders from forward, sir, said Daniels. Noticing Debman's involuntary look of surprise. All hands are to be on short allowance for a while, until something comes our way again. But why? asked Denman. Do you men include us in your plans and economies? Why did you not rid yourself of us last night, when you sent one of your number ashore? Daniels was a tall, somber-faced man, a typical ship's cook and he answered slowly. I cannot tell you, sir, except that both you and the lady might talk about this boat. Oh, well, said Denman, I was speaking for this lady, who doesn't belong with us. My place is right here. Yes, sir, agreed Daniels, but I am at liberty to say, sir, to you and the lady, that you'd best look out for Billings. He seems to be going batty. I had him talking to himself, threatening harm to this lady. I don't know what he's got against her myself. Tell him, said Denman sharply, that if he enters this apartment or steps one foot abaft the galley hatch on deck, the parole is broken. I'll put a bullet through his head. You might tell it to Jenkins, too. Daniels got through the wardroom door before answering. I'll not do that, sir. Jenkins might confine him and leave all the work to me. But I think Billings needs a licking. Whether Daniels applied this treatment for the insane to Billings, or whether Billings, with an equal right to a judge Daniels insane, had applied the same treatment to him, could not be determined without violation of the parole. But when they had finished supper and reached the deck, sounds of conflict came up from the galley hatch, unheard and uninterrupted by those forward. It was a series of thumps, oaths, growlings, and the rattling of pots and pans on the galley floor. Then there was silence. You see, said Denman to Flory with mock seriousness, 
The baleful influence of a woman aboard ship? It never fails. I can't help it, she said with a pout and a blush. Her blushes were discernible now, for the last vestige of the scalding had gone. But I mean to wear a veil from this on. I had one in my pocket. I think that would be wise, answered Deming, gravely. These men are... You see, Billy, she interrupted. I've got a new complexion. Brand new. Peaches and cream for the first time in my life. And I'm going to take care of it. That's right, he said with a laugh. But I'll wager you won't patent the process. Live steam is rather severe as a beautifier. But she kept her word. After the meager breakfast next morning, which Daniel served with no explanation of the row, she appeared on deck with her face hidden, and from then on wore the veil. There was a new activity among the men, a partial relief from the all-pervading nervousness and irritability. Gun and torpedo practice, which brought to drill every man on board except Munson, buried in his wireless room and one engineer on duty, was inaugurated and continued through the day. Their natty blue uniforms discarded, they toiled and perspired at the task. And when, toward the end of the afternoon, Old Kelly decided that they could be depended upon to fire a gun or eject a torpedo, Jenkins decreed that they should get on deck and lash to the rail in their chocks four extra torpedoes. As there was one in each tube, this made eight of the deadliest weapons of warfare ready at hand. And when a task was done, they quit for the day. The deck force going to the bridge for a look around the empty horizon, the cooks to the galley, and the machinists to the engine room. Denman, who with doubt and misgiving had watched the day's preparations, led Flory down the companion. They're getting ready for a mix of some kind, and there must be some place to put you away from the gunfire. How's this? He opened a small hatch covered by the loose after edge of the cabin carpet, and disclosed a compartment below, which might have been designed for stores, but which contained nothing, as the lighted electric bulb showed him. Coming up, he threw a couple of blankets down, and said, there's a cyclone cellar for you, Flory, below the waterline. If we're fired upon, jump down, and don't come up until cold, or until water comes in. Then he went to his room for the extra store of cartridges he had secreted, but found them gone. Angrily returning to Flory, he asked for her supply, and she, too, searched and found nothing but both their weapons were fully loaded. Well, he said philosophically, as they returned to the deck, they only guaranteed us the privilege of carrying arms. I suppose they feel justified from their standpoint. But on deck they found something to take their minds temporarily off the loss. Samson, red in the face, was vociferating down the engine room hatch. Come up here, he said loudly and defiantly. Come up here and prove it if you think you're a better man than I am. Come up and square yourself, you flannel mouth mick. The flannel mouth mick in the person of Riley, white of face rather than red, but with eyes blazing and mouth set in an ugly grin, limed up. It was a short fight the blows delivered by Samson, the parrying done by Riley, and ended with a crashing swing on Riley's jaw that sent him to the deck, not to rise for a few moments. Had enough? asked Samson triumphantly. Had enough, you imitation of an ash cat? Oh, I guess you have. Think it out. He turned and met Jenkins, 
who had run aft from the bridge. Now, Samson, this will be enough of this. What have you got to say about it? inquired Samson irately. Plenty to say, answered Jenkins, calmly. Not much you haven't. You keep away from the engine room and the engine room affairs. I can tend to my department. You tend to yours. I can tend to yours as well when the time comes. There's work ahead for... Well, attend to me now. You sweated me all day like a stoker at your work. Now go on and finish it up. I'll take a fall out of you, Jenkins, right here. No, you won't. Wait until the work's done, and I'll accommodate you. Jenkins went forward, and Samson, after a few moments of scarcely audible grumbling, followed to the forecastle. Then Riley got up, looked after him, and shook his fist. I'll get even with you for this, he declared with lurid profanity. I'll have your life for this, Samson. Then he went down the hatch, while Forsyth on the bridge, who had watched the whole affair with an evil grin, turned away from Jenkins when the latter joined him. Perhaps he enjoyed the sight of someone beside himself being knocked down. It looks rather bad, Flory, said Denman dubiously. All this quarreling among themselves. Whatever job they have on hand, they must hold together, or we'll get the worst of it. I don't like to see Jenkins and Samson at it, though the two cooks are only a joke. But there was no more open quarreling for the present. As the days wore on, a little gun and torpedo drill was carried out. While, with steam up, the boat made occasional darts to the north or south to avoid too close contact with passing craft, and gradually, by fits and starts, crept more to the westward. And Jenkins recovered complete control of his voice and movements, while Munson, the wireless man, grew haggard and thin. At last, at nine o'clock one evening, just before Denman went down, Munson ran up the sheet of paper, shouting to the bridge. Caught on! With the United! Night shift! Then, having delivered the sheet to Jenkins, he went back, and the rasping sound of his sending instruments kept up through the night. But when Devin sought the deck after breakfast, it had stopped, and he saw Munson, still haggard of face, talking to Jenkins at the hatch. Got his wavelength now, Denman heard him say. Took all night, but that and the code will fool them all. From then on, Munson stood watching his instrument only from six in the evening until midnight. Got more sleep thereby, and soon the tired, haggard look left his face and it resumed this normal expression of intelligence and cheerfulness. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe DeNoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey Chapter 23 after supper, about a week later, Demon and Flory sat in the deck chairs, watching the twilight give way to the gloom of the evening, and speculating, in a desultory manner, on the end of this never-ending voyage, when Munson again darted on deck and ran up the bridge stairs with a sheet of paper, barely discernible in the gathering darkness, and handed it to Jenkins, who appeared over it in the glow from the binnacle. Then Jenkins blew in the bosun's whistle, the shrill, trilling, and penetrating call that rouses all hands in the morning, but is seldom given again throughout the day, except in emergencies. 
All hands responded. Both cooks rushed up from the galley. The engineers on watch shut off all burners and appeared. The men, tumbling up from the forecastle, all joining Jenkins and Munson on the bridge. Demon strained his ears, but could hear nothing, though he saw each man bending over the paper in turn. Then they quickly went back to their places below or on deck, and, as the bells were given to the engine room, the rasping of the wireless could be heard. As the two cooks came aft, Demon heard them discussing excitedly, but inaudibly, the matter in hand. And, his curiosity getting the better of his pride, he waited only long enough to see the boat steadied at east-northeast, then went down and forward to the door leading to the passage that led to the galley. Billings was doing most of the talking in a high-pitched, querulous tone, and Daniels answered only by grunts and low-pitched monosyllables. Gigantia. Ten tomorrow. Five million. Were a few of the words and phrases Denman caught. And at last he heard the concluding words of the talk. Dry up, said Daniels, loudly and threateningly. Yes, thirteen is an unlucky number. But if you don't shut up and clear off these dishes, I'll make our number twelve. Glad you've got something to think about besides that woman. But shut up. You make me tired. Demon went back to Flory somewhat worried, but no longer puzzled. It gave the girl none of his thoughts that evening. He waited until morning, when, after a look around a bright horizon dotted with sail and steam, he said to her as she came up, Eat all the breakfast you can this morning, Flory, for it may be some time before we'll eat again. Why, Billy? What's the matter? asked the girl. We've traveled at cruising speed all night, he answered, and now must be up close to the corner, as they call the position where the outbound liners change to the great circle course. Well, she said inquiringly. Did you ever hear of the Gigantia? Why, of course. You mean the new liner? Yes, the latest and largest steamship built. She was on her maiden voyage when this boat left port and is about due to start east again. Flory, she carries five million in bullion, and these fellows mean to hold her up. Goodness, exclaimed the girl. You mean they will rob her? A big steamship? She's big enough, of course to tuck this boat down a hatchway. But these passenger boats carry no guns, except for saluting, while this boat could sink her with the armament she carries. Look at those torpedoes. Eight altogether, and more below decks. Eight compartments could be flooded, and bulkheads are not reliable. But will they dare? Desperate though they are, Will they dare fire on a ship full of passengers? How did you learn this, Billy? It seems impossible. Incredible. Remember the gun and torpedo drill? Said Denman, softly, yet excitedly. Our being in these latitudes is significant. They put Casey ashore the other night and robbed the captain and me to outfit him. I overheard some of the talk. He has reached New York, secured a position as night operator in a wireless station, studied the financial news, and sent word last night that the Giganta sails at ten this morning with five million in gold. And where do you think she is now? asked the girl, glancing around the horizon. At her dock in New York. She'll be out here late in the afternoon, I think. But, heavens, what chances to wait all day while any craft that comes along may recognize this boat and notify the nearest station. 
Why didn't they intercept the lane route out at sea, where there's no crowd like this? I can only account for it by the shortage of stores. Yes, that's it. No sane pirate would take such risks. We've plenty of oil and water, but little food. That Demon had guessed rightly was partly indicated by the action of the men and the boat that day. All hands kept the deck, and their first task was to discard the now useless signal mast, which might help identify the boat as the runaway destroyer. Two engineers sawed nearly through the mast at its base, while the others cleared away the light shrouds and forestay. Then, a few tugs and a leash shroud sent it overboard, while the men dodged from under. Beyond smashing the bridge rail, it did no damage. The dodging tactics were resumed. A steamer appearing on the east or west horizon, heading as to pass to the northward or southward, was given a wider berth by a dash at full speed in the opposite direction. Every face, even Flory's and Denman's, wore an anxious, nervous expression, and the tension increased as the hours went by. Dinner was served, but brought no relief. Men spoke sharply to one another, and Jenkins roared his orders from the bridge, bringing a culmination to the strain that no one could have foreseen. The sudden appearance of an inbound steamer out of a haze that had arisen to the east necessitated immediate full speed. Riley was in charge of the engine room, but Samson stood at the hatch, exercising an unofficial supervision, and it was he that received Jenkins' thundering request for more steam. Samson, in a voice equally loud and with more profanity, admonished Jenkins to descend to the lower regions and attend to his own affairs. Jenkins yielded. Leaving Forsyth in charge of the bridge, he came down the stairs and aft on the run. Not a word was spoken by either. But, with the prescience that men feel at the coming of a fight, the two cooks left their dishes the engineers their engines to crowd their heads into the hatches. Riley showed his disfigured face over the heads of the other two, and on the bridge, Forsyth watched with the same evil grin. But few blows were passed. Then the giants, locked and twisting and writhing, whirled about the deck. Flory screamed, but them in silence her. Nothing can be done, he said, without violating the parole. And even if... He stopped, for the two huge forms, tightly embraced, had reeled like one solid object to the rail, which, catching them at just above the knees, had sent them overboard, exactly as Samson had gone before. Man overboard, yelled Denman, uselessly for all had seen. But he threw a life buoy fastened to the quarter, was about to throw another, when he looked, and saw that his first was a hundred feet this side of the struggling men. He turned to glance forward. Men were running about frantically and shouting, but nothing was done, and the boat still headed a matter of forty knots an hour. Riley grinned from the hatch, and, forward on the bridge, Forsyth turned his now sober face away to look at the compass and at the steamer fast disappearing in the haze that followed her. Then, more as an outlet for his anger and disgust than in the hope of saving life, Demon threw the second life buoy high in the air over the stern and led the shocked and hysterical Flory down the stairs. Rest here a while, he said gently, and try to forget it. I don't know what they'll do now, but keep your pistol with you at all times. He went up the grave face to many heartfelt misgivings. For, with Forsyth and Riley now the master spirits, 
things might not go well with them. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of the Pirates》by Morton Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Joe Denoya, Chesterfield, New Jersey. Chapter Twenty Four. In about ten minutes, Forsyth ground the wheel over and headed back. But though Demon kept a sharp lookout, he saw nothing of the two men or the life buoys. He could feel no hope for Samson, who was unable to swim. As for Jenkins, possibly a swimmer, even should he reach a life buoy, his plight would only be prolonged to a lingering death by hunger and thirst, for there was only one chance in a million that he would be seen and picked up. After ten minutes on the backtrack, the boat was logically in about the same position as when she had fled from the steamer. But Forsyth kept on for another ten minutes, when, the haze having enveloped the whole horizon, he stopped the engines, and the boat lost way, rolling sluggishly in the trough. There was no wind, and nothing but a long ground swell and the haze to inconvenience them. The first in making it difficult to sight a telescope, the second in hiding everything on the horizon, Though hiding the boat herself. But at last Forsyth fixed something in the glass, gazing long and intently at a faint spot appearing to the northwest. And Denman, following suit with the binoculars, saw what he was looking at. A huge bulk coming out of the haze carrying one short mast and five funnels. Then he remembered the descriptions he had read of the mighty Gigantia the only ship afloat with five funnels since the Great Eastern. Forsyth called, and all hands flocked to the bridge where they discussed the situation. And, as Demon judged by the many faces turned his way, discussed him and Flory. But whatever resulted from the latter came to nothing. They suddenly left the bridge to disappear in the forecastle for a few moments. Then to reappear, each man belted in pistol, and one bringing an outfit to Forsyth on the bridge. Two engineers went to the engines. Forsyth rang full speed to them, and the rest, cooks and all, swung the four torpedo tubes to port and manned the forward one. The big ship seemed to grow in size visibly as her speed, plus the destroyers, brought them together. In a few moments, Denman made out details. Six parallel lines of deadlights, one above the other, and extending from bow to stern, a length of a thousand feet. Three tiers of deck houses, one above the other amidships. A line of twenty boats to a side along the upper deck, and her after rails black with passengers while as many as six uniformed officers stood on her bridge, eighty feet above the waterline. The little destroyer rounded two alongside, and slowed down to a little more than the speed of the larger ship, which permitted her to creep along the huge black side, inch by inch, until the bridges were nearly abreast. Then a white-whiskered man on the high bridge hailed, Steamer ahoy! What do you want? Want all that bullion stored in your strong room, answered Forsyth through a megaphone. And, if you please, speak more distinctly, for the wash of your bows wave prevents my hearing what you say. The officer was handed a megaphone, and through it his voice came down like a thunderclap. You want the billions stored in our strong room, do you? Anything else you want, sir? Yes, answered Forsyth. We want a boat full of provisions, three barrels of flour, the rest in canned meats and vegetables. 
Anything else? There was as much derision in the voice as can carry through a megaphone. That is all, answered Forsyth. Load your gold into one of your own boats, the provisions in another. Lower them down and let the falls unreave, so that they will go adrift. We will pick them up. Well, of all the infernal impudence I ever heard, yours is the worst. I judge that you are that crew of jailbreakers we've heard of that stole a government boat and turned pirates. You are right, answered Forsyth. But don't waste our time. Will you give us what we ask for, or shall we sink you? Sink us, you scoundrel? You can't, and you better not try or threaten to. Your position is known, and three scouts started this morning from Boston and New York. That bluff don't go, answered Forsyth. Will you cough up? No, most decidedly no, roared the officer, who might or might not have been the captain. Kelly, said Forsyth, send that white head straight into him. Whitehead torpedoes, be it known, are mechanical fish of machine steel, self-propelling and self-steering, actuated by a small air engine, and carrying in their warheads a charge of over 200 pounds of gun cotton, and in their blunt noses a detonating cap to explode it on contact. At Forsyth's word, Kelly turned a lever on the tube, and the contained torpedo dived gently overboard. Denman, looking closely, saw it appear once on the surface, porpoise-like, before it dived to an indicated depth. The inhuman devil, he commented, with gritting teeth. A muffled report came from the depths. A huge mound of water lifted up to break into scattered fragments and bubbles. Then these bubbles burst, giving vent to clouds of brown and yellow smoke, while up through the ventilators and out through the open lower deadlights came more of this smoke and the sound of human voices, screaming and groaning. These sounds were drowned in the buzzing of thousands of other voices on deck as men, women, and children fought their way toward the stern. Do you agree? yelled Forsyth through the megaphone. Do you agree, or shall we unload every torpedo we've got into your hull? Old Kelly had calmly marshaled the crew to the next torpedo, and looked up to Forsyth for the word. But it did not come. Instead, over the buzzing of the voices came the officer's answer, loud and distinct. We agree. We understand that your necks are in the halter, that you have nothing to lose, even though you should fill every compartment and drown every soul on board this ship. So we will accede to your demands. We will fill one boat with the bullion and another with provisions and cast them adrift. But do not fire again, for God's sakes. All right, answered Forsyth. Bear a hand. Breast to breast, the two craft charged along, while two boats were lowered to the level of the main deck, and swiftered into the rail. Sailors appeared from the doors in pairs, each carrying a box that taxed their strength and made them stagger. There were ten in all, and they slowly and carefully ranged them along the bottom of one of the boats, so as to distribute their weight. While this was going on, Stewards and galley helpers were filling the other boat with provisions, in boxes, barrels, and packages. Then the word was given, and the boats were cast off and lowered, the tackles of the heavier groaning mightily under the strain. When they struck the water, the falls were instantly let go, and, as the boats drifted astern, the tackles unrove their long lengths from the blocks and were hauled on board again. 
Forsyth stopped the engines and then backed toward the drifting boats. As the destroyer passed the stern off the giant steamer, a shout rang out, but only Demon heard it above the buzzing of voices. And it seemed that only he saw Casey spring from the high rail of the mammoth into the sea, for the rest were busy grappling for the boat's painters, and Forsyth was looking aft. When the painters were secured and the boats drawn alongside, Forsyth rang for half speed, and the boat, under a port wheel, swung away from the Gigantia and went ahead. There's your man Casey, yelled Denman excitedly. Are you going to leave him? Forsyth, now looking dead ahead, seemed not to hear. But Riley spoke from the hatch. Hold your jaw back there, or you'll get a passage too. With Casey's cries in his ears, sick at heart in the belief that not even a life buoy would avail, for the giant steamship had not stopped her engines throughout the whole transaction, was now half a mile away. Demon went down to Flory, obediently waiting, yet nervous and frightened. He told her nothing of what had occurred, but soothed and quieted her with the assurance that they would be rescued soon. End of chapter 24Chapter 25 of The Pirates by Morgan Robertson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The engine stopped, and, climbing the steps to look forward, Demon saw the bridge deserted and the whole ten surrounding an equal number of strong boxes, stamped and burned with official looking letters and numbers. Farther along with a provision, and a peep astern shown Denman the drifting boats. The big gigantia had disappeared in the haze that hid the whole horizon, but up in the western sky was a portent, a black silhouette of irregular outline that grew larger as he looked. It was a monoplane, an advanced scout of the scout boat, and Denman recognized the government model. It seemed to have sighted the destroyer, for it came straight on with a rush, circled overhead, and turned back. There was no signal made, and, as it dwindled away in the west, Demon's attention was attracted to the men surrounding the boxes. Only Munson was still watching the receding monoplane, but the rest were busy. With hammers and cold chisels from the engine room, they were opening the boxes of treasure. Did anyone see that fellow before? demanded Munson, pointing to the spot in the sky. A few looked, and the others answered with oaths and commands. Forget it. Open the boxes. Let's have a look at the stuff. But Munson spoke again. Forsyth, how about the big fellow's wireless? We didn't disable it. He has sent the news already. What do you think? Ah, shut up, answered Forsyth irately. I didn't think of it. Neither did anyone. What of it? Nothing afloat can catch us. Open the box, let's have a look, and we'll beat it for Africa. I tell you, vociferated Munson, that you better start now, at full speed, too. That's a scout, and the mother boat isn't far away. Will you shut up, or I shut you up? shouted Forsyth. You'll not shut me up, retorted Munson. You're the biggest fool in this bunch, in spite of your bluff. Why don't you go ahead and get out of this neighborhood? A box cover yielded at this juncture, and Forsyth did not immediately answer. Instead, with Munson himself and Billings, the cook, insanely emitting whoops and yelps as he danced around for a peep, he joined the others in tearing out Excelsior from the box. 
Then the bare contents came to view. Lead! howled Riley as he stood erect, heaving a few men back with his shoulders. Lead it is, if I know one metal from another. Open them all, roared Forsyth. Get the axes, pinch bars, anything. Start your engine, yelled Munson. But he was not listened to. With every implement that they can lay their hands on, they attacked the remaining boxes. And as each in turn disclosed its contents, there went up howls of disappointment and rage. Lead, they shouted at last. All lead. Was this the job put up for us? No, yelled Munson. Not for us. Every steamer carrying bullion also carries lead in the same kind of boxes. I've read of it many a time. It's a safeguard against piracy. We've been fooled, that's all. Forsyth answered profanely and as coherently as his rage and excitement would permit. Munson replied by holding his fist under Forsyth's nose. Get up on the bridge, he said. And you, Riley, to your engines. Riley obeyed the call of the exigency, but Forsyth resisted. He struck Munson's fist away, but received it immediately full in the face. Staggering back, he pulled his revolver, and before Munson could meet this new antagonism, he aimed and fired. Munson lurched headlong and lay still. Then an uproar began. The others charged on Forsyth, who retreated with his weapon at arm's length. He held them off until, at his command, all but one had placed his pistol back in the scabbard. The dilatory one was old Kelly and him Forsyth shot through the heart. Then the pistols were redrawn, and the shooting became general. How Forsyth, single-handed against the eight remaining men, won in that gunfight, can only be explained by the fact that the eight were too wildly excited to aim, or leave each other free to attempt aiming, while Forsyth, a single target, only needed to shoot at the compact body of men to make a hit. It ended soon with Hawks, Davis, and Daniels writhing on the deck, and Forsyth hiding, uninjured, behind the forward funnel, while Riley, King, and Dwyer, the three engineers, were retreating into their engine room. Now if you've had enough, shouted Forsyth, start the engine when I give you the bell. Then he mounted to the bridge and took the wheel. But though the starting of the engines at full speed indicated that the engineers had had enough, there was one man left who had not. It was Billings, who danced around the dead and the wounded, shrieking and laughing with the emotions of his disordered brain. But he did not fire on Forsyth, and seemed to have forgotten the animus of the recent friction. He drifted aft, muttering to himself, until suddenly he stopped and fixed his eyes on Denman, who, with gritting teeth, had watched the deadly fracas at the companion. I told you so. I told you, ran out the crazed voice of Billings. A woman aboard ship always makes trouble. There, take it. He pulled his revolver and fired, and Denman, stupefied with the unexpected horror of it all, did not know that Flory had crept up beside him in the companion till he heard her scream in conjunction with the whiz of the bullet through her hair. Then Denman awoke. After assuring himself of the girl's safety and pushing her down the companion, he drew his revolver and, taking careful aim, executed Billings with the cold calmness of a hangman. A bullet nearly coincident with the report of a pistol, came from the bridge, and there was Forsyth, with one hand on the wheel, facing aft and taking second aim at him. 
Denman accepted the challenge and stepped boldly out of the companion. They emptied their revolvers, but neither did damage. And, as Forsyth reloaded, Denman cast a momentary glance at the black spot in the southern sky. Hardly sweeping the upper horizon, he saw still another to the east, while out of the haze in the northwest was emerging a scout cruiser, no doubt the mother of the first monoplane. But she was two miles away, and soon began spitting shot and shell, which plowed up the water perilously near. You're caught, Forsyth, called out Denman, pointing to the south and east. Will you surrender before we're sunk or killed? Forsyth's answer was another shot. Flory, called Denman down the companion. Hand me your gun and pass up the tablecloth. Then get down that hatch out of the way. We're being fired at. She obeyed him, and, with Forsyth's bullets whistling round his head, he hoisted the flag of truce and surrender to the flagstaff. But just a moment too late. A shell entered the boat amidships and exploded in her vitals, sending up through the engine room hatch a cloud of smoke and white steam, while fragments of the shell punctured the deck from below. But there were no cries of pain or calls for help from the three men in the engine room. Forsyth left the bridge. Breathing vengeance and raging like a madman, he rushed aft. I'll see you go first, he shrieked. He fired again and again as he came. Then, realizing that he had but one bullet left in his pistol, he halted at the galley hatch, took careful aim, and pulled the trigger for the last time. There are tricks of the fighting trade taught to naval officers that are not included in the curriculum at Annapolis. Denman, his loaded revolver hanging in the right hand of his side, had waited for this final shot. Like a duelist, he watched, not his opponent's hand, but his eye. And, the moment that eye gave him the unconcealable signal to the trigger finger, he ducked his head, and the bullet sped above. Now Forsyth, he said, as he covered the chagrined marksman. You should have aimed lower and to the right. But that's all past now. This boat is practically captured, and I'm not going to kill you, for, even though it would not be murder, there's no excuse in my conscience for it. Whether the boat sinks or not, we will be taken off in time, for that fellow yonder is coming and has ceased firing. But before you were out of my hands, I want to settle an old score with you. One dating from our boyhood, which you'll perhaps remember. Toss that gun forward and step aft a bit. Forsyth, his face working convulsively, obeyed him. Flory, called Denman down the hatch. Come up now. We're all right. She came, white in the face and stood beside him. Off with your coat, Forsyth, and stand up to me. We'll finish that old fight. Here, girl, hold this gun. Flory took the pistol, and the two men discarded their jackets and faced each other. There was hardly need of describing in detail the fistfight that followed. It was like all such where one man is slightly the superior of the other in skill, strength, and agility. In this case, that one was Denman. And, though again and again he felt the weight of Forsyth's fist and reeled the deck occasionally, he gradually tired out his heavier, though weaker, adversary. And at last, with the whole weight of his body behind it, dealt a crashing blow on Forsyth's chin. Deadman's old-time foe staggered backward and fell face upward. He rolled his head to the right and to the left a few times, then sank into unconsciousness. Deadman looked down on him, 
waiting for a movement. But none came. Forsyth had been knocked out, and for the last time. Flory's scream aroused Denman. Is the boat sinking, Billy? He looked and sprang for a life buoy, which he slipped over Flory's head. The bow of the boat was flush with the water, which was lapping at the now quiet bodies of the dead and wounded men forward. He secured another life buoy for himself. As he donned the cork ring, a hail came from a beam. Jump, it said. Jump, or you'll be carried down with the wash. The big scout ship was but a few lengths away, and a boatful of armed men was approaching. Hand in hand, they leapt into the sea, and Denman, towing the girl by the becket of her life buoy, paid no attention to the sinking hull until satisfied that they were safe from the suction. When he looked, the bow was under water, the stern rising in the air higher and higher, until a third of the afterbody was exposed. Then it slid silently, but for the bursting of huge air bubbles, out of sight in the depths. About a year later, Lieutenant Demon received a letter with a Paris postmark, which he opened in the presence of his wife. In it was a draft on a Boston bank made out to his order. Good, he exclaimed, as he glanced down the letter. Listen, Flory, here's something that pleases me as much as my exoneration by the Board of Inquiry. Then he read to her the letter. Dear Sir, Inasmuch as you threw two life buoys over for us, you may be glad, even at this late period, to know that we got them. The fight stopped when we hit the water, and since then, Samson and myself have been chums. I saw both buoys thrown, and held Samson up while I swam with him to the first. Then, from the top of a sea, I saw the other, and getting it, returned to him. We were picked up by a fisherman next day, but you will not mind, sir, if I do not tell you where we landed, or how we got here, or where we'll be when this letter reaches you. We will not be here, and never again in the United States. But we want to thank you for giving us a chance for our lives. We read in the Paris Herald of your hearing before the Board of Inquiry, and the story you told of the mess Forsyth made of things, and the final sinking of the boat. Of course, we were sorry for them, for they were our mates. But they ought not to have gone back on Casey, even though they saw fit to leave Samson and me behind. And, thinking this way, we are glad that you licked Forsyth, even at the last minute. We enclose a draft for $550, which we'd like you to cash and pay the captain, whose name we do not know, the money we took from his desk. We hope that what is left will square up for the clothes and money we took from your room. You see, as we did not give Casey but a little of the money, and it came in mighty handy for us too when we got ashore, it seems we are obligated to return it. I will only say, to conclude, that we got it honestly. Samson joins me in our best respects to Miss Fleming and yourself. Truly yours, Herbert Jenkins. Oh, I'm glad, Billy, she exclaimed. They are honest men after all. Honest men, repeated Denman quizzically. Yet, they stole a fine destroyer from Uncle Sam. I don't care, she said stoutly. I'm glad they were saved. And, Billy boy, her hands were on his shoulders. If they hadn't stolen that fine destroyer, I wouldn't be here today looking into your eyes. And Billy, gathering her into his arms, let it go at that. End of chapter 25 End of the Pirates by Morgan Robertson.
Read by Joe DeNoia, Chesterfield, New Jersey. March 13th, 2022.